will bring the meeting to order. Uh, is there any changes or adjustments to the agenda as presented? And I would add uh, Charles Gallagher's resignation letter from the Johnson Fiber Committee, as well as adding a discussion on the usefulness of that committee and whether we want to continue it or not. So I would add those two things. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, is it time for additions? Yes. I just want to make a, uh, I got a, a note from Julia Mingeldorf and uh, she would like me to extend a thank you uh, concerning uh, everybody stepping up to help her dad this past Friday night. Uh, and it's just a short thing I'd like to read. Okay. And another question, I had somebody call me about Scribner Bridge. Okay, Scribner I guess they'd like an update on Scribner Bridge. Okay, maybe we'll have uh, Brian give us an update, either Brian or uh, we'll do that as part of the highway uh, report. I wanted to add as, as a subject um, that how we could encourage um, participation in the LCPC broadband survey. Um, which is quite important to our, or maybe important to obtaining uh, fiber in our community. Okay. Does anyone got any, want anything else? Okay. Um, I'm guessing Rosemary, as part of her report, will be bringing up about the land reg records digitation that she had in her report. So I guess I won't add that. If there's done others, then is the board prepared to approve the meeting minutes for July 6, 2020? We didn't have them yet, Mr. Chairman. I thought we got them from Donna. I didn't see any July 6. We got the village's notes from July 6, but the town's notes from July 6 are not ready yet. Oh, okay. Okay, then I guess we'll skip over that. Uh, that would get us into Rosemary. Okay, I sent you the current budget status report and I have about 25,000 left in payables to book up. Plus I'm assuming that you're going to want to um, book up the balance of what we haven't spent on paving for, for, for last year and to this new paving contract that we're, we're going to have next for the fall. Right. And that's about $70,000. Before those, yes. Is that why our summer roads budget is 43% spent? Yes. That explains that, thank you. And to date we're at approximately 93% total spend of the, of the expenditures. And I also sent out a current listing of delinquent taxes. And currently with the penalties and interest, the total for last year is $123,612. Okay. And I've also attached the current warrant for today. And the tax department publishes the tax rates on Friday of each week. And currently Johnson is still not on the list. And I know Brian sent them some information last week regarding the reappraisal. So hopefully we'll have it soon. So we're not gonna be able to set the tax rate tonight? No. Okay. And we have sent out about 350 absentees ballots for the primary election on August 11th. Mm -hmm. And late last week it was announced that there would be $2 million available from the CARES Act for digitizing the land records. I haven't had a chance to review this yet. And one of the stipulations is that everything has to be completed by the end of the year. Is this something that the board wants me to look into? Anybody from the board? Go ahead, Nat. What's the downside? 
I haven't looked at it enough to know that I know there's several regulations that have to be with the federal money that has to be um, requirements for. It's, it's work that needs to be done that we're spending, that we've been budgeting and spending quite a bit of money on. So yeah, it's, yeah. it yeah. seems like looking into it, it's definitely worthwhile. Okay. I agree. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I'll do that then. Okay, thank you, Rosemary. That's all, that I, that's all that I had from my report. So what's the board's pleasure on the warrants that need signing? Want to authorize the chair or do you want to everyone come in and sign them? Motion to authorize the chair to sign. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify saying aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Those opposed? Okay. And so you're all set on the primary, primary Rosemary? Do you got a plan in place? I'm working on it, yes. Okay. Anybody got any further questions for Rosemary? I was just looking at the budget status report. It looks like we got through winter on 85, 86% spent on our budget. That's pretty good. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's great. And bridges and culverts, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is more of a Brian Krause question. 25% spent on bridges and culverts. I was wondering if we've been doing less work on culverts or what the what happened there what what the one of the payables i do have is is for culverts which is several thousand dollars but that won't increase it that much no it'd still be under half that includes money that was coming out of the bridges and culverts fund for a study on scribner bridge that wasn't undertaken in during that financial year because we just didn't come to terms yet uh, so that is rolled over to the the upcoming year gotcha thanks um, but that one is not going to be excess funds because that is related to a drawdown that we had from the bridge and culvert reserve fund um, so it's we're also going, we're going to see a decrease on the uh, income side because we didn't use that money. Thanks. Anyone else? Anything else, Rosemary? No. Okay, thank you. Brian Krause, you, you're up. You probably have to unmute him. Yeah, taking just a second. There you go. Can you hear me now? We yes. can hear you. Okay, um, as far as the culverts line item on the budget, we should be pretty much spent on there. I bought a bunch of supplies towards the end of the month before the fiscal year ended. So that should not be um, too much of an excess there. Okay. You have, well, I think you have my report in front of you. There it is. And there wasn't too much I needed to talk about. Things are going along pretty good. I did want to give you an update on the high wall reclamation in the, in the pit. It's going pretty good. Um, I have to schedule some stuff with GW Tatro, but close to the end of August, we should have that high wall reclaimed, which will be a big headache off of, off of our shoulders anyways, uh, for, runoff and stabilization. It'll, it'll help us out quite a bit. Great. Okay, Brian. Uh, one thing I had a question for you, Brian, with relation to the PPE and mask, is how is that all going with the, uh, the guys in the highway? It's going pretty good. Um, Sometimes it gets a little bit lax, but we're still trying to follow the protocol that's set forth and we have plenty of masks and hand sanitizer and we're not lacking for supplies. Okay. I just was wondering if they were uh, a lot of pushback or if it was still uh, going fairly well. I'd say it's still going fairly well. Okay, good. Um, 
some there was a request to bring up a discussion about Scribner Bridge. Unless you've got something else, Brian, this might be a good opportunity to bring that up and fill everyone in. Just some questions on what the status is. I think that might be a better, unless you're talking to Brian Story, it might be better for Brian Story. He's more in touch with FEMA than I am. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, we can cover it here so that we're getting it done early. Uh, but yeah, it is mostly kind of on my side that um, FEMA has just pretty recently been able to uh, move our case forward where they're studying for mitigation, whether we qualify for that. And they're going through with our cost estimates. And um, yeah, it, it is proceeding. There was a, a large hang up for uh, several months when they were not allowed to do in-person site visits. Uh, but we've made it past that point, And so it's, it's rolling again. Do we anticipate it would be done by winter? Or started? Started by winter, I would think so. Done by winter is going to be a little bit harder. Um, I don't know enough about exactly how that project is going to go um, to give it a good timeline on how long it'll take us to finish. Uh, and I also don't know yet when we're going to get the approval from FEMA. But okay. it is moving again. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I, I mentioned that we are, that doesn't directly relate to Scribner Bridge, but it relates to our access to Scribner. Directly relating to Scribner Bridge, uh, we do have the, that we are going to ask for an engineering study on Scribner Bridge to carry out uh, one that we had scoped a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, that we're going to try and carry out the engineering studies so that we can apply for a construction grant for repairs on Scribner Bridge in particular. The abutments are an area that are highlighted in our bridge status report as an area that needs attention. Okay. Anybody got any questions for Brian Krause or Brian's story? I just want to make a point, Eric. Go ahead. I can't. I can't believe it's rocket science to fix that uh, uh, slope to the bridge. You know, uh, putting the abutments and all that aside, I just can't believe it would actually take that long to open that bridge up. Uh, I've talked to some people. Uh, we saw all of that debris that was in the bottom after they got washed out, and that was permanent. Uh, all we need is three foot diameter rocks in there and a small cap on top. And so if the next time the water comes around, it'll actually push that uh, silt and everything in between the rocks and actually stabilize it even more. I just can't believe that it's gonna, we have to study this thing to death to fix that bridge. Anyone else? I don't know that, I don't know that that's being studied. That's already been, there was already study on that. I think what Brian Story was talking about is studying the repair needed actually on the bridge. Okay. Not, well, the, not the road going to the bridge. The road going to the bridge should be fixed. And that should not take that long to fix, I don't think. Well, it won't take that long to fix, but we need the money is what we're holding out for, is for FEMA to pay the money to do it right. So we're not just blowing it in there just to fix it again. I understand that. But that's what okay. the rock business is all about. And, yes. Uh, yeah. So it, it doesn't really take that much to figure that out. No, you it are was correct. Just the, uh, with the coronavirus, they were not allowed to do site inspections for several months. Uh, so they couldn't come out and make a determination on our project until recently. But that thing was all studied many years ago on what to do with that particular deal. I don't, yep. I don't really get it. It's just these wheels move so slowly. It's just absolutely maddening, actually. <laughs> Welcome to FEMA world. Yeah, well. Okay, anyone, anyone else? 
Uh, I've got one other thing to bring up, um, and that's this relates to our, uh, some of our discussion around class four roads, but uh, Basin Road. Um, we got a couple letters today uh, that came in requesting comments on what we're going to do on Basin Road. Um, and I want to give a little bit more detail on that with the board's permission. Um, so that's the first item on your report is the class four highways, right? Is this yeah. So we okay. can cover it under class four, uh, or we can cover it as part of Brian's highway report. Oh, is it a separate, little bit separate item that they're requesting? Well, it's, it actually relates to the FEMA. So I'll, I'll, I'll just get into it. The, the Basin Road also suffered some damage when a culvert plugged up, water overran the road and caused a great deal of uh, erosion uh, on Basin Road. Um, and it wasn't in the culvert. So there is some debate about whether FEMA is going to reimburse us for the damages, the, the damage repairs. The advice we're getting is to go ahead and complete the repairs in advance and then continue trying to recover the costs. Um, so that's what we're moving forward with. It is not going to be an easy task uh, because Basin Road will not support our complete heavy equipment and a complete loadout for making the repairs. Uh, so we, it'll be lighter equipment, it'll be a different deployment um, uh, when we go up to make the repairs in, in that area. So it is gonna be a little more time consuming than normal, but it, it, the repairs on Basin Road are proceeding. Okay, it's with the culverts? It's gully erosion. So it is required under our, uh, under the new MRGP, the Municipal Road General Permit and our new class four uh, road standards. Okay. Um, but there is some debate with FEMA of whether they're going to reimburse us for those costs or not, because it is class uh, four. It's class four, and this is a new requirement from the state for us to make these repairs. Do you have a cost estimate? Um, and Brian, you can help me with that if you have any. And time? To yeah, I had. I had worked one out. I don't have it with me. It really wasn't that much. Um, five loads of material, bucket it in with a loader and spread around. The problem was you can't get at it with a truck. So you're gonna have to wheel the, the material in, you know, a little ways, which will be time consuming. Mm -hmm. it'll, be, it'll be a day with the loader and half a dozen loads of material. Okay. So our, back to the budget status report, looks like we haven't spent anything on class four roads this year or very little, is that right? I believe that is correct, yes. Yes. So the money, it sounds like what we budgeted $2,500 is gonna go a long way to fixing that. Yes. Yes. Great. It's underway. It is a requirement for us, uh, but this gets at one of our concerns with the Municipal Road General Permit and our new road and bridge standards is that for us to bring our proper equipment up to the site, we would have to make significant improvements to Basin Road, which would blow out the scope of the project and the cost associated with it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we just got a, uh, We got a couple letters from Mr. Lindemann and Mr. Uh, Fidolfi. So I wanted to share those concerns. Okay. I think I saw Mr. Fidolfi on on the call tonight. Did has right. he got his hand up? I don't see it. Or okay. in, I don't see it in chat, so. I think Bob okay. Lindemann was on too. 
I was just going to give them an opportunity to speak to this if they wanted to while we were talking about it. But if they're they're okay, then we we'll, we can move on. We can probably get rid of the uh, report of the public works for me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it looks like uh, Mike Fidolfi would be happy to share comments. So, Mike, I'm going to uh, unmute you. Okay, go ahead, Mike. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah th this sounds great. Um, we certainly appreciate the town's willingness to help out here uh, and, and help where the damage needs to be repaired. I think the only other concern we may have had was that in the notes for tonight's meeting, it shows that their interest to move Basin Road from a class four to a trail. Is that still on the agenda for this evening or has what we just discussed changed that narrative moving forward? There is on the agenda discussion that what's been sent to us from the planning commission with regard to class four highways and we have not got to that point yet of deciding which roads would be thrown up the trails or what action will be done. Okay. All right, thank you. And before we leave, Brian Krause, is there anything else for Brian or does he have anything else he wanted to add? I'm guessing he'll probably want to stick around for the class four road policy. I would recommend it, but it's not, I wouldn't say it, it exactly requires it, Brian, but uh, yeah, you might, we'd probably be interested in hearing your opinions too during that discussion. Probably stick around. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Okay, yep. why don't you get into your report there, Brian, story. Okay. So the first item is our discussion on class four roads. Um, so in general, uh, this continues our discussion on uh, class four roads and like Basin Road, it, the interest in this is born out of um, the fact that we are going to have a greater, uh, a greater requirement for improvements on class four roads. So we need to think more carefully about which roads we're willing to uh, retain that obligation for? Which roads do we want to uh, ha have to make that requirement or have to make those improvements? Um, the new requirement is specific to hydrologically connected road segments. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at. And then the, the, that also has to balance the interest of residents on those roads and uh, the town, the public's interest in uh, maintaining our rights of way and our access to all parts of the town. So Rob Moore is, from LCPC is here to help us with this greater context. So Rob, I'm going to unmute you uh, and you can help join the conversation with us. Okay, Rob, go ahead. Uh, hello, thanks for having me everyone. Um, it was a great introduction, Brian. Um, I think you summed up the um, variables uh, to be considered uh, properly. Um, I think the purpose of, uh, of me being here is to just briefly explain the idea of the, the, the municipal road general permit and answer any questions about that um, and uh, how that um, I might be of help um, moving forward. Um, so as you all know, um, we ha have conducted a road erosion inventory of uh, the roads in Johnson as required by the municipal road general permit. And um, preliminary results of that um, indicate a, a very good compliance rate. Uh, as you might recall, the municipal road general permit regulates erosion and uh, specifically sediment and phosphorus and the loading um, of the pollutants that are controlled by the EPA and the uh, agreement between the EPA and the state about Lake Champlain. 
Um, the portion of those pollutants in the lake were determined to come from roads. And part of that uh, legislation includes the requirement to do a road erosion inventory and um, take action to remedy uh, the, the problems uh, that are identified. Um, so the good news out of approximately 920 um, segments of uh, road um, in the town of Johnson in a segment being 100 meters or 328 feet, um, more than half uh, are simply not jurisdictional to the law. Um, half, more than half of those that are subject to the law are in full compliance in their current condition as of the date of the inventory. And that inventory represents a snapshot in time. And so as of that date, then therefore a little less than half of the roads that are jurisdictional to that law uh, are not fully compliant, meaning that um, a majority of them uh, partially meet the standards of the law and uh, a small fraction of them um, do not meet the strict standards uh, whatsoever. Um, the idea of this, um, this road erosion inventory um, may be useful uh, to the town when thinking about um, classifications of, of roads. And um, as Brian um, indicated, the many variables that um, come into making decisions about the status of those roads um, and the legal standing of those roads on the books. Um, so um, I, I think at this point, I'd like to um, uh, offer that um, I would be happy to provide um, a, a list um, for the Planning Commission and as, a res as a related to their work on the policy that um, is under consideration by the board, um, I'd be happy to offer um, a list of, of uh, uh, road segments that are jurisdictional to the law and the issues or whether they have issues or not on those sections of roadway um, as has been identified by the Planning Commission. Um, it's just a little extra piece of information that may be useful to um, everyone in making decisions. And um, in fact, the Planning Commission made it quite easy for me um, to do that um, in terms of they put together a very nice list. Um, so I've already started to poke around um, at the data and how the data uh, specifically reflects um, some of those roads or some portions of those roads that have been identified by the Planning Commission. And um, so at this time with that offer to the Town of Johnson, it would be my pleasure to do that and work with the Planning Commission and Brian's story on that moving forward. And um, I'll just leave it at that and ask if there's any questions about uh, my work at LCPC on this project for the town. Uh, I just have one general question, and uh, this is something I was never really sure about with the legal uh, trail. If we go from reclassify from class four to a legal trail, we do retain our right of way. However, what about some of the uh, purposes that class four highways are used for? Would they still be able to? be utilized by the, the snowmobile clubs, the ATV clubs, uh, hikers, whatever? Uh, the short answer is my understanding is yes. Um, I would suggest uh, double checking um, the statute um, to uh, verify that for yourselves, but my understanding of that is, is yes. Um, it is uh, a reflection of the, the true basic meaning of the um, the public uh, rights of way uh, across the lands um, of, of the town of Johnson. So if someone had a camp beyond where we make it a legal trail, they would still be have access and be able to drive to their camp? Yes, and I'm familiar with uh, various examples in, in different towns that have um, uh, 
various approaches to a sim that similar theme that you just described, um, where landowners um, access their property and, and any amenities they might have there for recreation or um, sporting or whatnot. Um, and uh, I think as, as you were indicating, that's under the purview of uh, uh, the same um, um, set as prop set of processes that's under the select board's um, jurisdiction as far as designating the classes of roads and the allowable uses on those roads per the um, appropriate statutes. So the big advantage of reclassifying to a legal trail is getting the town out of any liability for the the right of way as far as uh, maintaining anything. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that question. Well, like with class four highways, uh, we have certain uh, obligations that we must fulfill as we just heard with Basin Road, uh, with gullies and uh, culverts and bridges and, and such. But if we reclassify it as a trail, we would have no obligations for any maintenance of any sort. Yes, in terms of the municipal road general permit and um, the uh, legislation that supports the Lake Champlain Clean Water Act, um, uh, that is correct. That the municipal road general permit is only jurisdictional to um, classes of ro town road one, two, three, and four, um, and and I that that. I, I observe that that, that puts a, a decision making point on, on the board and, and uh, as far as weighing all the different variables, environmental and property rights and legislations and the requirements and the costs and, and many, many, many factors that um, beyond those that have been listed. Anyone else got any questions? Uh, Charles Gallanter had his hand up, hand up when we're ready for. Okay, let's let the board first, if any members got any. Is there, uh, go ahead, Doug. Sorry. Rob, is there, is there any uh, thought that the uh, general permit might be amended because uh, to include trails, since uh, it's obvious that the hydrological connection isn't gonna go away by the classification question. I'm not aware of um, any of those conversations Doug um, no the the permit is subject for review and potentially revisions um, on a cycle of every five years which if I'm counting correctly I believe is coming up in 2023 that's my count too Can a legal trail be upgraded to a class four, class three road, just theoretically, legally? Yes. Yes, there's a different process, uh, similar, but yes, it's uh, a, the public process that allows the select board to um, uh, go down in the sequence of, um, of, of classification also allows for that to go up upwards um, through the classification process uh, given following the proper procedures that are spelled out uh, to be followed. Um, that's very possible and um, is probably the, um, the, the greatest um, um, uh, benefit to the select board as far as uh, outside of, of retaining the right of way for use of the people Currently, um, the preservation of that right of way is um, into the future. Thank you. Any other board members? If not, uh, Brian, why don't you open up Charlie's mic? Okay, Charlie, go ahead. So in answer to your earlier question, uh, Eric, the, uh, we wanted to keep the class four road to the last driveway so that we wouldn't be eliminating anyone's access to a camp. 
We talk about discontinuing throwing up that portion of the class four road after the last or at the last driveway. <clears throat> and in terms of, we were not, I'm not, let's see. We didn't hear that our charge was to be concerned with hydrologically connected roads. Although we did consider that, that if it became a trail, we wouldn't have to do all that culvert and bridge maintenance that you have to do on a class four road. We were also aware that uh, if you convert it to a trail, the town retained its, its uh, right of way and it could subsequently upgrade to a, upgrade a trail back to class four or take an existing trail and make it class four for that matter, or even class three. So I think that answers those two questions. Also a question on your first point. Um, that I got, we've gotten from someone by email. Um, you talk about uh, changing to legal trail at the last driveway. Yes. Does that, does that mean last driveway on the class three portion, last year round drive, or the last driveway on the whole road? The last driveway on the class four portion. We didn't look at class three roads. We were not charged with that. We only looked at class four roads. We would suggest that you we are recommending that you change to a legal trail at the last driveway, whether it's year round, part time, whatever. People have a property right in that road to provide access to an existing property. Thank you. I guess I would disagree with Charlie on, on the planning commission charge. Uh, the second paragraph of the letter to them raises the issue of the water quality issues in Shade Lake Champlain and the Municipal Roads General Permit. And in my opinion, the Municipal Roads General Permit and the hydrologically connected portion is the dollar issue that prompted this discussion. And, and I think it ought to be reviewed you know, to the extent up until that point we were maintaining, you know, there could be disagreement about what we should maintain, but there was no thought about giving it up converting to trails until until that came along there was no cost really or minimal cost to, to retain our uh, our roads now we're going to have to do work on them and uh we can make the cost of that disappear if we act, act like the wizard of oz and call these things uh trails I, th I think you're, you got a good point there, Doug. Uh, I guess I would also question where you change it to a legal trail, sort of arbitrary for the time in, we're in right today in the, the last driveway, but there could be properties further on on that uh, class four highway that somebody could have intentions of building a house, building a camp or what have you. Um, you know, I'm not sure if it's, uh, if they've always had access to a, their further on property and we're, we would now potentially deny it, not deny it, I guess if they could still drive it on, drive their vehicle on a trail, but I, I'm just questioning that whole thought process on how you came up with where to convert. That's why you have public hearings. That was the feedback you guys heard? No, that, that was our attitude was that, you know, this is the best that we can do at this time. If people, you know, you have to, before you can make this conversion, I believe you have to have a public hearing and you notify the property owners. So that's, yep. you know, it's part of the process. This is our recommendation based on what we know today. What factors did you consider in, in, in this recommending the various aspects of this policy? Well, certainly we were aware that uh, that there's road maintenance costs coming up on a class four road, you know, generically. What the specifics of your municipal road general permit, we never saw that. We didn't see the road erosion inventory, but we knew that there were costs associated with maintaining a section of road as a class four 
as opposed to throwing it up to trail status with the cost of maintaining it. Well, given even the policy, the policy of what you're supposed to do on class four roads, there's no requirement that you do anything on a, on a trail. So we're aware of the economics and we're trying to save you money, Doug. Thank you. Yeah, this is the part of the process where the where <laughs> once it gets to the select board, we scrutinize it and we ask lots of questions and it, uh, um, it isn't intended for any planning commission members or anybody that contributed to, to this. This is really um, a, a ton of work that went into creating this proposal and, and it's appreciated. But we, we're still going to do our due diligence and ask the, yeah. the questions. Um, on the Basin Road, though, you know, someone we were talking about Basin Road. I see there's a house at the end of Basin Road on the Google Maps, uh, but it's asking to discontinue, to change to a legal trail. Well, we were working with the state map, and there's no house beyond uh, Cross. So. I at the there, end of there, there is a house on Basin Road, seeing as how I can see it from my house, but I don't believe, I think, uh, I think the crosses own the land up to it and the state land might be beyond that. Okay. It's that far up? Well, I, I see Bob and, and Dick Cross posting most of the land up past that uh, past that house that's owned by Michelle and Mickey. Yeah, I, I'm, we're unaware. We were not aware that there was a house up there, Doug. Okay. There was a driveway. Yeah. So that's so we, we would modify on that basis. We would modify our suggestion. You know, because typically we have change to a legal trail at the last driveway. So if there's a driveway up there, our recommendation would change. Mm -hmm. The uh, Bob Lindemann and uh, Mr. Fidalti are here and I think Richard Cross, they have not year round residents, but very, very nice camps up there. Is that a driveway that one considers? You consider it a driveway? Well, I, I didn't generate the policy. I was just asking you what you were characterizing. We would, if there was a driveway, we would consider it whether it was permanent or part year, Doug. Okay. okay. Yeah, we didn't want to take anyone's access away. Okay. Well, you're not taking your access away anyway, if it's still a trail. Well, okay. You know, the deal is we need to reduce our liability and save as much money as possible. We're not taking away their legal access, but we would be taking away their practical access. Because you wouldn't have to maintain the culverts and the bridges to that driveway. That's true. They would, they would totally have to maintain the trail for access for their, you know, to have a vehicle. Right. Additionally, additionally, I think in the future, I don't think the select board will be less busy than we are now. And, you know, things don't get on our agenda if we don't have time to do them. You know, so, so this yes, public hearings are, are, are a problem, grading and upgrading. So I think we need to be very careful with this. I, think that I appreciate the work that you folks did. I would really like to have the hydrologically connected portion examined in connection with driveways and things like that, because those are the, those are the, uh, the money parts of this. Right, in that case, you'd need to provide us with the municipal road general permit and the road in, erosion inventory. And we're certainly taking another look at it. Um, the letter that you referred to earlier, Doug, I don't know if that was shared with the entire uh, commission. Why was it my understanding that that was a, the hydrologically connected road piece was a, one of the main reasons why we were giving this over to the planning commission? Well, we looked at it in general, Kyle, 
Okay. We were aware that it's a policy. We don't know where, we didn't know where the, the culverts and bridges are. We've not seen your inventory. We're, we're aware of it in our, in our head without knowing any specifics. I think the hydrologically connected survey really just became available too, you know? Okay, well. So you would not have had that. Yeah, that, that data, it, as, as it relates to the road erosion inventory uh, has really been in progress. Um, so it, it yeah, it, it's just available. So there is more data, like Charles was saying about the uh, properties that he wasn't aware of. That there, there are evidently some. We have more recent data than he had available to him. I think we should probably, if if we're if we're considering having them look further into this or take a second look at it, we ought to send them the letter again, which was our direction, um, and. So they could take a look at that, as well as the, the municipal uh, roads general permit. And, and I noticed that there were quite a bit of, uh, you know, that had a lot of attachments. So, but I think that the, they ought to look at, consider everything, including, uh, in, you know, I, I noticed in in uh, the the letter we were had had, that had forward uh, with regard to the. Um, Prospect Rock Road, you know, the, the amount of usage on the road matters too. Public parking, trailheads, things like that, all sorts of all sorts of things. I think the, the presence of the Gomo place matters or to be considered, even though it's beyond 1,800 feet of hydrologically connected, you know, we're going to have to weigh different things on that, as well as the, the future. I noticed that, that when they talked about Class 4 roads, Class 4 roads are important to us and they're important to the to the future. They're an investment for our the future citizens. And I think we we've been hesitant to give them up, and and we ought to uh, give up some, and maybe not all. You know, but we're asking them to consider the future of the town, its economic, environmental well-being, uh, and come up with a policy. Please. That's why we did not recommend abandoning any any. Uh any rights of way. We were looking far into the future. Right. How much money? You want us to spend all your money? We can do it. <laughs> well, we're not trying to do that. <laughs> we're, we're trying to be prudent. Well, Charles, you did, there are three roads, three sections that you proposed discontinuing. Yes, but they were on state property. Okay. I just want to be clear. Discontinuing a portion on, on uh, Basin Road. There, part of the road is in the state forest. Uh, Prospect Park again, and I believe on Reservoir Road, there's a portion that's on state property. I, yeah, okay. I just want to make sure I understand because, uh, yeah. It, and why did you, the committee, recommend throwing those up completely? Let the state pay for it. Yeah. But if it's a legal trail, what would we have to pay for? Well, we'd be discontinuing it so we wouldn't have to pay for anything. Okay. There's nothing we can do with it anyway. It's not our property. It's on state property. Right, but we would still have our right of way, our highway. I'm not so sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, we I don't think. I, I'm not. I. I guess it should be determined. I wouldn't believe that if we had a, if we have a uh, town highway, class four, class three, whatever, and the state acquires the land, I don't think they get our right of way. I don't know. Yeah, something to be something to be considered. Besides, they just passed a law saying they do. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions on the policy itself, if that's uh -huh. uh, or if yeah. we should open it up. Um, they both have to do with funding. Um, section four on page three. Town policy class four highway budget. Um, the last sentence, um, the last, it says that the, the select board will annually propose a sum of money in its judgment necessary to meet the requirements for the preservation of structure of class four highways. The line item shall be subject to vo voter approval. Does that mean right. 
under the Dave Williams ruling, um, we vote on the budget up or down as a whole. You don't vote on line items, but this reads to me like you'd be voting on this separately. What is the intent there? Uh, the intent is that you wouldn't be voting. Well, we didn't think you'd have to vote on it separately, but that the town would be committed to that amount of money. Okay. And it also says, um, the next page that uh, item four, uh, budgeted monies shall be spent annually or placed in a dedicated reserve fund. So in order to do that, we would actually need a separate vote at town meeting to establish that fund. Is that correct, Eric? Yes. Yeah, we need the voters to establish. So we can't just adopt this policy as it is. We could adopt okay. it with some sort of caveat, I guess, that we approve that at town meeting. I'm, and generally speaking, I, it's, we're getting more and more of these reserve funds, and it provides less flexibility in times when, you know, the economy collapses and we need to COVID-19 happens. Yes, I'm, just let me finish up. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly my point, um, that we need to move it from the class four road budget to buying more sand so that we can uh, keep the roads, the class three roads safe. The, uh, the feedback we got from the public is that the town isn't doing very much of anything on, on their class four roads. We had several very vocal um, members of the public attend our, attend our meeting to make that point. Well, you just heard in our budget summary, we budgeted 2,500 and virtually none of it was spent. So right. that's, a, so that's, that's probably a fair characterization. Yeah. I wanted to, on the uh, policy, I think, you know, I, I'd be absolutely opposed to putting the burden of proof on the town. Yeah, I know you would. Okay, so just, just wanted, and I think that if, if this gets sent back to you to ask you to consider the uh, hard hydrologically connected, I think you, we ought to send you our current policy of how you move from a fourth class to a third class road, because there are people who, have petitioned to become third class, have, have paid the freight, have gone through that policy, and, uh, and, and that's still available, uh, albeit likely expensive. Uh, there are other people who uh, are maintaining their road and uh, probably at some point could petition to, to be, bring it up. You know, I'd like you to compare, take a look at our Current third class upgrade. How how you get there? To no problem doing that, but well, to what point, Doug? Um, well, to to the point, I guess, of uh, the question of how much are we going to budget for this? Because you can say that there are people appearing who don't want this. On the other hand, there are a lot of budget clocks, and they're saying, "Why is our budget so very high?" And upgrading highways is a very expensive uh, pro project, and these uh, there are reasons. You know, it's contrary to our current methodology. Uh, there's clear pressure to do that right now for third for fourth class roads. We can have a standard that does a lot. We can have a standard that does a little. I don't know what we can do that would fit the budget uh, requirements or ability of this town. You know, I, I would love. I've asked Brian Story if he could query other towns to find out what they have as standards for this. The town of Callis, which uh, which uh, was the case that I provided, basically right. did nothing, and the court said that's okay. I don't know that doing nothing is okay. On the other hand, I don't know that we ought to provide driveways to people. Good point, Doug. <laughs> I just, that's, why, that's why, at least from my point of view, we wanted you to study it because it's, it's for the well-being of the whole community. Brian, we have a really good culvert inventory. Does that also capture culverts that are on class four highways? Yes, it does. Okay. Was that shared with the planning commission? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah, that week. 
we provided a number of resources. Uh, I think there's a communication breakdown at some point and not everything that we offered was taken up. Yeah, and I'm not sure that's your fault, Bob. Okay. I think the Planning Commission has done a great job on this so far. Mm -hmm. A lot of work's been put into a it. A lot of work. And yes, thank you. Certainly appreciated, uh, Charlie. Yes. Well, you're welcome. And I got to say, this most of this was done before I became chairman, so I can't take much credit. Well, yes. So be it. I wanted to give all board members first uh, crack at this, but if nobody has anything further to add, then we would open it up to the general public. Not hearing anything. Okay, Brian, why don't you go ahead and see if anyone's got their hands up. Okay, um, Michael Badolfi, I've got you up first. Okay, Mike, go ahead. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, guys. Uh, I, I won't take too much time and beat a dead horse here, but uh, Charles and Doug, I think you guys brought up some great points as to why the stretch of Basin Road should remain a Class 4 highway. Um, and according to the policy, at least for the town, and it's the general policy to not reclassify or upgrade unless there is a demonstrated public benefit to doing so which at this point, based on the discussion we've had this evening, I have not yet to see a public benefit in doing so unless something comes back from the hydrologically connected survey that suggests otherwise. So I, I think until there's more information, it would seem to me that we keep the current course of, of what stands. Um, and that's my two cents on the matter. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, Greg Tatro, I've got you up next. Okay, Greg, go ahead. Hey, guys, uh, ladies. Um, it was quite a process getting through this thing, and I think we all changed our minds several times when it came to turning these roads to trails or keeping them class four or, or throwing them up altogether. And uh, basically, we thought liability for some roads that don't go anywhere. As far as and Charlie may 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 think different, but um, we felt like it was a lot of liability for the town. Let's say you had another Irene in some road way off and uh, that you can't even get to with normal equipment. Um, you'd have to pay it. A lot of money to fix that road and with the state being the way they are um, you could pay a pretty big fine you know if that road's not maintained and then the culvert plugs up and it washes out well they could say well why didn't you maintain that town of Johnson and and a lot of these roads nobody ever goes on to so it's kind of a you know the last house thing like Charlie was saying or last can the uh, uh, that was quite a thing because we didn't know well it can't consider a, a house or is a house considered a camp or any, any house that goes should have to be class four we also understood that uh, that people pay for a piece of land that was uh, on a clock or a road and you change it to a trail well maybe it's not fair for that so it was it was uh it was quite a project to uh, try to figure this out but uh, i guess my point of view was i didn't want to saddle the town with you know some big bill if we got another irene that's kind of why that's where i was coming from but also thoughtful of the people who live lived up in there so that's that's my take thank you all right, thank you, Greg. And then one more. I don't have a first name, but uh, Dolph, I've got you up next. I'm trying to unmute you now. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate uh, everything uh, that has been discussed. And 
Uh, I am one of the property owners on Basin Road. And um, one thing I guess I do want to point out, uh, because I think Charles maybe uh, questioned um, what's up above B, uh, Bob Cross's property, but uh, that is one of my, that's my property up above his gate. And there are two more property owners above me. And, uh, and now we actually have a, uh, a permanent resident uh, living off of uh, Basin Road. So um, we, we appreciate uh, certainly any effort uh, that's been put forth to this point and uh, certainly look forward to um, this, where this ends up because as it stands right now, we cannot get to our property. Period. That that the damage to that road is is so extensive that we cannot drive up to our properties. So, with that being said, I again I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Rob, you've got your hand up. Okay, go ahead, Rob. Uh, I just want to comment on the last comment about the road damage being so extensive that you can't get up to your property. Unless that road damage is a culvert or it's a bridge, the town's not going to fix it anyway, whether it's a class four road or it's a legal trail. Um, so, I mean, that was one of the things we weighed as well when we talked about this is, you know, if we downgraded to a legal trail, you know, what kind of maintenance does a town actually do on a class four road? And, and it, it's really not much at all. So, I mean, I, obviously you need to be able to get to your property, but I'm not sure class four road or legal trail, it'd be the town would help you any more or any less than they're doing, you know, currently. Thanks, Rob. We did, re we did review, um, we spent a lot of time on Basin Road and it's, Really, it's a tough road to maintain. The Basin Road? Yes. Okay. What about its use as the uh, Green Mountain uh, of the Long Trail? It's, a, it's an access to the Green Mountain to the Long Trail. Well, it goes to the Long Trail. It goes to the Long Trail State Forest, but it's real. Well, yeah, it's it does connect to the Long Trail also. And it's 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 you know they're on foot, you know, so they they could probably they can get by the erosion right now. I'm certain, but you know it is a community resource as an as a uh, access to the long trail. It's marked on the on their trail guide. I think it's uh, the Davis Neighborhood Trail or something like that. You want to keep it as a trail? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm only presenting that in terms of we're supposed to think of, or thinking about uses like Prospect Rock. Diana Osborne is talking about thousands of cars in the year. You know, we're talking. I see people there regularly, but it's not in the it, it's not in the thousands. I can guarantee you that. Okay. You got anyone uh, else? More members of the public. Okay. Uh, Bob, I'm, I've got you right now. Uh, Chad and Ken, I see your hand up, so I'll call on you guys in just a second. Okay, Bob, go ahead. Okay, have I been unmuted? Yes, you yes. have. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know how to use, you know, this program all this that much. So trying to uh, talk has been a little bit difficult. I think the uh, first I want to thank everybody for the work you've done. And I am the last property owner up there. And frankly, I like the road in a, you know, rugged condition. You know, that's the way we had it. And I think my only point right now is I would like to have access to my property. Yeah, and right now I do not. So all of my time spent up there requires a one mile bike 
carrying everything up. But another point I made one day in my letter to the town is the other day as I was going up there, I noticed that search and rescue was there and they were checking out the road in terms of being able to rescue people you know, from the long trail. So it provides an access to them. Yeah. So if search and rescue can't get up and someone is injured on the long trail, uh, that doesn't sound too good to me. You know, also in terms of the long trail, they need to do maintenance on places like Corliss Camp. A year ago, they had to carry up all of the material, but at least they were able to get to the state property line and be able to carry it up. You know, additionally, the road is, you know, access for backcountry skiers, for skiers, for snowshoers, you know, for everybody else. So in my opinion, I think a road should at least be kept open. But one thing that actually bugs me a little bit in some of the conversations, and I apologize if this offends anybody, but I start hearing these things which say, well, if we throw the road up, I mean, if we turn it to a trail, all of a sudden, we're no longer responsible for polluting the brook when the culvert fails and the damage along the road was caused by a culvert failure. The, the culvert plugged, the water came up over the bank and wiped out a small portion of the road. Now, it's not a washout that just occurred because the road was you know, steep or anything. It occurred specifically because the culvert failed. And all I'm asking is that, could you please make that portion of road again passable so that I can at least get to my property and not have to backpack you know, everything in. You know, right now there's a 20 pound propane cylinder sitting in my garage that needs to be carried a mile up the road. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Bob. All right, and Spencer. Uh, trying to unmute you, Spencer. Let's see. Can you hear okay, us? Okay, go ahead, Spencer. Uh, it's Ken Toronto, actually. Okay. Uh, my, qu my question is, is, so when was actually the last time the town spent money on a class four road? <laughs> I, I, I'm asking this because you haven't in the last three years. VASA and VAST has taken care of all class four roads in the town of Johnson. We've even paid to get road permits. And the last time that you spent money on a class four road, you gave culverts to Norm Laurel and everybody up on Cotton Hollow and they did the work themselves. So I don't understand why the issue is because we've volunteered. I know I'm speaking for the ATV club, not necessarily VAS, but I know VAS fixed Sinclair Road last year on the heart, Sinclair East Johnson on the Hyde Park side and the Johnson side. We fixed Sinclair the spring before. We completely fixed Cotton Hollow to solve all the erosion problem. Uh, Brian Krause went down with us and he said we did a great job and there has been zero erosion since we did that. So I don't understand why the town's saying that you guys spend so much money on the road when you haven't. I wouldn't say that we have spent a lot of money on our class four roads. I'd say that there is, and I really appreciate the the partnership we've had with the private clubs uh, doing a lot of work, but what we're concerned about is the potential for future costs and what our, you know, our, our the amount of money that we might owe uh, for this maintenance, but you're right. Right now we are able to, get really good mileage on the money we do spend by providing materials for folks to do a lot of the labor themselves. Uh, okay, well, I, I just kept hearing the cost of maintaining the roads. And as I said, this, unless there's another class four road that you've been working on that I don't know about, the two clubs in Lamoe County have fixed all your roads. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Private right. interests of clubs or, or people who live on the road or, or whatever are doing the majority, virtually all of the work. Okay. Now my other question is you turning it to a trail. How is that going to hurt my property value on cotton hollow? Uh, everybody else's property value on cotton hollow. When it goes to the class four section, you're going to totally destroy my property value up there to my camp. 
because you are no longer classifying it as a road. And then when you do take the chance to re-bring it back into their classification, how many loopholes is the town going to have to jump through and how much money is this going to cost the taxpayers to get it back to a class four road status? Well, I, I can take a stab at that. To bring it back to a class four highway would be a hearing that the select board would have to hold and where we are not required to do maintenance on class four highways it wouldn't relatively cost us any money to, to do that. Um, right, but he, he was saying that if we turned it to a, to a trail or whatnot, that you would have to go through the process to bring it back up. So once you agreed to bring it to the trail, is there the normal catch-22 where you're going to have to jump through loopholes to bring it back to a certain stage, a certain status, to be able to call it a Class 4 road again? where you, it would have been better to keep it a class four road, maintain it and to keep it at that level? No, I don't think, I wouldn't characterize it that way. I think if it was a class four highway or a trail, it could look exactly the same. Good. And as far as your property value, uh, that would be on your, uh, your card at the Lister's office. And they already grade the property with the class highway and, Class four highway to a trail probably doesn't change the value of the grade much. Well, it's not called a road anymore. So if I wanted to sell it, it wouldn't be called a road anymore. It's called a trail. Right. So that, but, that so would, in, in my opinion, that's going to totally damage everybody's property value. So I don't feel the town should go anywhere near calling any of them a trail because it'd be really foolish of the town to give up road status and then possibly have a chance of the rules changing down the road to not bring it back to a road. Thank you. Right. Uh, and Rob. Uh, no, no, he didn't. Okay, go ahead, Rob. Uh, I just wanted to comment to Bob Linderman. Bob used to be my shop teacher, so... Uh, <laughs> I kind of know who you are. Uh, if if there's a culvert on that road that's out, legally the town has to fix it. If I were you, I would I would be at the town clerk's office every day asking them why they haven't fixed it. But uh, I mean, the law says they have to maintain bridges, culverts, class four roads. So that's that's your right. I live on a class four road too myself, so I I feel your frustration. Thank you, Rob. We already approved uh, earlier in the meeting to take care of that culvert issue on Basin. Do we have anyone else? Brian? I don't see anybody yeah. else. I guess I would ask the board what's their pleasure on this. Do you want to send it back to the Planning Commission with comments for another look? take action or, or start proceeding? I think we should send it back with some comments and additional information. Take Rob Moore up on his uh, offer to provide the uh, hydrologically connected uh, segments. Okay, that's Doug's take on it. What's the rest of the board members? Too yeah. many pro oh, sorry. Sorry, Mike. I was just gonna, um, agree with that. I think there's, um, after tonight's conversation, there's a lot more information on the table that should be considered and sounds like a lot more information about the hydrological piece that I think is super important. Okay, Mike. Too many problems with it to go forward as written. Okay, and Nat? I agree with the rest, yes. Okay. So I guess so, we'll do just so I understand what you're sending back to us, we're going to look at the municipal road general permit. We're going to look at the road erosion inventory. We're going to review the class three upgrade criteria and talk to Rob Moore. Anything else? It's plenty in it. <laughs> I think that know, well, it's more than it's more than enough. I just asked him, you know, you want to pile it on. No, no, no more. Oh, I do. Um, figures you, would. Want, you want us to read the callous decision? You could read the callous decision to so you can see exactly we can choose zero or the Cadillac. And 
thinking about on, on class four. Um, and I think maybe uh, Brian might uh, send our original letter with some thoughts, additional thoughts or something. Original letter. Okay. I think the, the letter I, Diane Osborne sent. I was going to ask about that. Not the most recent one, though that's valid too, but the one that she sent before with all the detail and all of the breakdown. I mean, she had some typos in there and stuff. Um, that should be um, looked over by the Planning Commission as well. I think that would be helpful for you. Okay. What, what I learned from this discussion tonight is that the devil's in the details, you know, from, from Michael Fidalsi and Bob Lindemann and learning about a permanent residence, maybe a different one than I know, uh, the people that I know are residents are, can't get here because they live in Canada right now. Um, I, I think the, uh, you know, we ought to, I don't know how you get this kind of participation with regard to every single road, but I learned an awful lot more about those, uh, about uh, from Diana Osborne and uh, the conversation tonight. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Eric. Yes. D Diana did an excellent job too, by the way. Yes. I don't even think she's tuned in tonight, but she did some fantastic work in that. No, letter. she had in for tonight. What's that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, I think we're ready to move on to the next item update on the informational permit ordinance. Okay. So uh, I've made the updates that were uh, requested at the last meeting. Um, just to avoid confusion, this is no longer the building permanent permit, it is the informational permit. Uh, but it is uh, a very similar ordinance. Um, let's see, all right. I'm gonna share the screen so we can review this here. So took out all references to building permit and permission and uh, restructured the way that we do review of permits uh, so that it is, there's no decision in it. It's you tell us about the building we issue an informational permit. It's not a question or uh, any review. Uh, I made that more clear and, and I think, I hope sufficiently clear. Uh, then, we changed the administration into um, just a single step that the permit is applied for and it receives the informational permit and that's it. There's no additional steps. There's no expiration or anything else. And included a notification that uh, no penalty shall be enforced before and the recommendations that that is set at six months from the passage of the ordinance. What's board's thoughts? Is it ready to send for legal review? I think so. I'm personally so not thrilled with the, the name of it. Uh, and I unfortunately can't, I thought that there was a few good ones thrown out at the, our last meeting, but I don't have the minutes in front of me um, to recall them. But the, the way it's titled right now, just, uh, I I don't I don't know what it's about. I still think building needs to be in there, but um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that's a, a really good point. Um, you know, I understand the, the interest in making this more clear that this is for informational purposes only and that this is not like a normal building per permit that people think of when they think of a building permit. But I think that 
uh, I think that this makes it a little bit less clear. Mm -hmm. I think I think I suggested in our last meeting that we strike the word permit altogether because that feels um, that that maybe gives off the wrong the wrong vibe of what this is and say form like informational building form or build certificate certificate. Uh, Shoot, I wish I could remember what some people put in the chat because I thought there was a couple good ones. Um, and actually, I think it was, I think it was um, Diana who <laughs> put a couple good ones in there. Okay, Beth is saying notice, a building notice. That sounds good to me. Town of Johnson building notice or informational building. Ah, that sounds too wordy, I think. I think just building notice. What, what if just building was inserted between Johnson and informational? Town of Johnson building informational permit. Well, informational building permit. Or informational building permit. Okay, I, yeah, I think I just, I just think building needs to be in there somewhere. Um, I agree. Okay. Mm -hmm. Building notice, well, I don't, I'm not good at this, but building should make it more descriptive for sure. Doug, Mike, you guys have opinions? That oh, no building permit. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> no building permit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I felt like permit sounds so authoritarian, you know, like we're coming to get you. Whereas um, notice maybe so sounds a little. Building, notice, building notice, building notification, ordinance. That's why just put in. Town of Johnson building information. Mine was a joke, not any name <laughs> at all, just nothing. Uh, we, we Scrap know. it. <laughs> we, we got that, Mike. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I wanted to be very clear with it. <laughs> Lois says notice to build. Town of Johnson notice to build. Building notice. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like that actually. Notice to build. I don't. I look. I think what we we what we give them, we could call a notice to build. When they apply it to us, they're applying for. That yeah, I think I like Donna's suggestion that she just put up a building notification ordinance, and then we issue a notice to build. Okay. So it'd be Town of Johnson building notification ordinance. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I like that too. Yeah, I think the, the combination of those works that it, it's a building notification ordinance. And what we issue from it is a notice to build. Perfect. Mm -hmm. We have a majority consensus on that. Sure. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Yes, sir, Mike. We were talking last time about bringing this before the voters at town meeting, correct? Uh, I, I know we had spoke of that, but I don't recall that going anywhere. Well, I thought it did. No, well, I'd made the suggestion that that's how we go about it. But in the meantime, we would continue to uh, finish it up, get it out for legal review, cross the, D, the T's, dot the I's, and then the board could decide whether to pass it or delay it. Well, I think it's basically finished, don't you, Nat? Uh, Brian was talking about bring, sending it to legal review, which I think well, is- Well, right, but I mean, it's finished as far as the board goes. It, to bring it to legal review. That's my point, that it's, that we're done with it at this end. 
I think we're very close. I, I think so. Yeah. Yep. Is the board prepared to send it to legal review? Yeah. Do you need a Do you need Do you need a motion or do you just consensus? I don't. I don't think so. Just a consensus to send it legal review. Yep. I'm ready. Doug. Yes. Kyle. Or I mean uh, Nat. Yes. Okay, Brian. Won't we send it? No. To legal review? <laughs> no I knew that. <laughs> we just said yeah. <laughs> well, to move this forward, you know, it, you're going to study it to death, uh, meeting after meeting after meeting, uh, just get the ball rolling. I agree. Okay, it's going to legal review. Woohoo! All right. Uh, we do have a, a public comment, so if we're ready for that. Okay, go ahead. Open it up. Okay, Evan, I'm unmuting you right now. Okay, go ahead. When this originally started out, it was a building over 100 square feet in a bedroom, right? And then that, what triggers a permit, right? Oh, uh, <laughs> Noted. There we go. Scroll, scroll. Yeah. Before constructing any building or structure. So why are we now encompassing ponds and pools and patios, everything in this? Because right there it says before constructing any building, go up to definitions. And I know what the definition technically is of a building, but it's described in this document in section three. Definitions. Building, meaning assembly of materials, any materials, blah, 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 mobile homes, trailers, a swimming pool, or a deck, or a patio. Just in those simple words for stupid people or people that want to hold your head to the grinding stone over nothing they took the simple informational thing and if i want to do anything who's to say we can't just add a fence in there because if i build a fence that covers an area we might as well need a permit for that too right well i think the i don't think that has changed i think that it has uh I, I haven't I have tried to write it with a pretty expansive definition of when a permit was required with the idea being that since there's no fee or anything else associated with this uh, that we'd be better off having people make contact than not because you could be fined if you didn't make contact sometime when you should have that we would promote people making contact Again, because it's not, there's no permission, there's no fee, there's nothing in there, it's just, you let us know. Uh, we exempted a couple things, but those are our only exemptions of freestanding buildings less than 100 square feet and replacements of a building with a similar building of equal area and number of bedrooms. Uh, right. But the, the that's from where this started to where it's to now, it's already morphed way beyond what the listers had even asked for where it started of an addition, a building that's more than 10 by 10 or a bedroom. I don't know why they wanted a bedroom so bad, um, but whatever. So now we're going to send them around a quarter of the town every year. And we're going to send them to his house because he put a pool in. Mike Dunham put a pool in. He had a permit for that. And Charlie Gallanter put a deck in. He had a permit for that. So this is actually going to cost the taxpayers more in the end, right? Because they're still going to have to cover that quarter of the town. They got to go to everybody that pulled a permit. Well, they're What's doing it today. House? They're, they're doing it today, Evan going to every place that they're aware of that has had any modifications or improvements. So, this was, so they still cover a quarter of the town every year? Yes. And then they still go to places that they can easily see a difference in, basically. That, that they've been able to learn that there's been something done there. And sometimes it's a lot of searching and uh, to find these places because, uh, you know, they don't know who the contact people are. Uh, they just didn't feel comfortable sometimes being in the situation. 
okay. Um, I guess my point is it's morphed into much more than what's here. Uh, is there agricultural exemptions for stuff like this? I mean, how far is this going to go? Can we put something? Can we put something in the ordinance that we're adding because it's an ordinance, not a permit now? Whatever. It says it can never be amended. It would have to be completely gotten rid of if anybody wanted to go to zoning, something like that, that would make the taxpayers a little happier. Well, we could not put something in here that would uh, direct a future select board from being held to do something or not do something. Only the voters could hold a future select board from doing something. So that's a, a no. Right, that's a no. I mean, we, we really tried to pare this down to make it as simple but functional as we could. No pool at my house, I can tell you. <laughs> I think, yeah, I'd like to. I'm of, saying it morphed into any time you touch the property. What's, what's the point of owning property if I got to? At this point, I don't have to ask for your permission because it's not zoning, but we're going that route. I think I just like to kind of push back on the idea that it's it's morphed or expanded. I think as Brian Story said, the language, the swimming pool in that is consistent with earlier drafts to, to my knowledge. And we've actually gone from kind of a more complicated document based on feedback from folks to a much simpler format that's basically like three yes or no questions in a couple of short sentences. So I think we've actually made it less onerous and um, very simple. I know. Thank you, Evan. It's a losing battle, Evan. Is there I know. Anyone... It's already been lost. Is there anyone else? Brian, I can't see you. Uh, I'm not seeing Walter as a comment. Uh, says construction can't begin until a permit is issued. Then it's a permit, not a notice. Um, and it says approval is still required. That's zoning. Uh, Those are all questions that I have too. But, but it's not. Let's see. Walter, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you so we can kind of dig into that a little bit. Okay, Walter, uh, are you thinking, uh, are you talking about the uh, section four part A? Yes, we're still saying construction cannot begin. That requires approval. Somebody has to approve this, so you still technically have a permit. Permit basically says you cannot do anything until we tell you you can. So this is not an informational document. You are still requiring approval. And I mean, we stress that you know in um, part six as well, and um, etc. So when you keep saying this is, the people try to keep calling this informational notice. I'm sorry, if you're going to require approval, it's a permit. Period, because somebody can basically say no. And as long as you have an approval process, somebody can say no, and that is a permit. And so you can put pretty words in the title, but that's not what the document is doing. Could anybody hear Walter? I, I struggled, but I think I caught most of it. I, I would question Walter where he sees it there's an approval because it's it's spelled out that it's an automatic approval it's more of we just need it for informational i can change the wording a little bit in section six part a which i think has something that walter was uh referring to and that it does use the word approval uh but i think what I, what it was intended, and this is why we get legal review, but what was intended in this, it says the town shall provide, I'm oh, sorry, part B, uh, no.
No, I think I can beef this up a little bit. Um, it should say uh, that the town shall issue a permit, or if we're rephrasing this, it should say that the town shall issue a um, a notice to build uh, when it receives an application. And that the word shall means that we, we must do it, that it's not a decision process. That it's we receive it, we process it, and we issue a notice to proceed. So you can strike review the project? Yes, I think that we can strike that. I don't want to wordsmith it right now because I'm missing the section that I'm, I'm looking for, but that it, it should not have an approval process. And if it if it does, that's an artifact of other earlier drafts. And, and that is not the intention. What we do is acknowledge receipt and shall issue a permit. Yes. So do you want to go through it and scrub it again, Brian, and bring it back to us? I would be, if you're comfortable with it, I'd be comfortable making that change and then sending it for legal review. Uh, that is not a change in uh, okay I think that to my mind that's a relatively minor change because that's changing the language to make sure it reflects the intention that the board has asked for the rest of the board agree yes. Rub it and bring it back I'm fine with um, legal review I am too. Kyle yes I am too Nat? Yes. Okay. So yeah, go ahead and make the changes. Yeah, that, that's, it is not intended to have a, an approval process that we tried to strike that out. Um, yeah, uh, in chat, Marla says that uh, she believes the word application uh, kind of has the connotation of an approval process. Um, so we might, I might clean up that language while I'm cleaning up the language about, you know, that it's a notice to build instead of a permit. Um, well, I'll scrub this for language that uses the word approval uh, and permit. You know, change permit to notice and then send it out. I don't think that I'm uh, changing any of the intended meaning that you have. I'm just bringing that up to our current understanding. Okay. I think everybody's happy with that. Okay. Uh, Expanded ATV. Yeah, Eben, I'm lowering your hand. I think that you had your hand still up and that it was not that you'd raise your hand again. All right, on our expanded ATV, the back at town meeting, um, Vasa had asked for expanded access to downtown Johnson and the gas stations in particular. Uh, we held a vote at town meeting and the recommendation uh, was passed at town meeting uh, that the board should consider providing that access. And we've got a few representatives of the ATV club present on the phone. Uh, so Ken and Spencer and everybody, I'm going to unmute you if you want to provide any kind of background and comments. Okay, go ahead, guys. All right. Uh, I'm Ken Tarangio, Spencer Legat, Chad Latero, who's our new vice president of Green Mountain ATV. Uh, so I went forward to town meeting and asked the residents to allow us to go down Main Street from Gould Hill to Maplefields and to also go down Railroad Street to get across the Lamoille River using the bridge because the southern part of Johnson has been cut off from the trail system all this time since, I believe, 2006, since you opened the roads to allow us to get through. Um, 
due to COVID and everything, you know, we're just trying to bring money to the town. So I don't know if any of you have been watching the news and see that the city of Newport opened all their roads to ATVs. And if you read any of the newspaper articles from that way, from all the businesses that said their business has tripled. Um, we've got, uh, what's the restaurant? The one out by the lake. Oh, East side, side, yep. East side restaurant. We can get to East side restaurant. They love us. We can get to the gas stations. Uh, Hoagie's Pizza, Pick and Shovel, Pick and Shovel, and everybody's written up articles in the newspaper in Newport saying how much we've improved their business. Um, we'd like to bring some more business to Johnson. You guys were gracious enough to let us use the town land to get down to Jolly's. Uh, I believe this is our second year. Um, I asked Jolly's for a written statement explaining how much we've benefited them. They denied because they're a corporation, but they said wholeheartedly they'd hate to lose this. Uh, basically, we went through the process in the, that town meeting, and as you all saw, everybody was pretty okay with it. I'd like to see it go through the grievance section and get put into the paper and get it moving. Um, we all freaked out when we thought we were losing our college. This COVID sticks up much longer. We're going to – am I still there? Yeah, you're still yeah, here. You're still if COVID kicks up much longer, we're going to lose the last, what, two restaurants we have in town. Um, I just think it could wholeheartedly benefit the town. Um, we haven't had many complaints. I talked to Brian's story last week. He called me up and said there was a complaint on Whole Egg Road, asked me to go re-sign it. I jumped on it. I went right up, put up new signs. Uh, there is an issue with that, though, Brian, I needed to bring up also. Uh, the town, when you enacted the ordinance back in 2006, you placed ATV signs on all of your street signs, same the speed limit. So in order for me to do Hawaii Road at 15, like you suggested, I need to be able to take that sign off your speed limit sign because nobody's going to listen to my signs if the town has their own speed limit sign for ATVs up. So that's one thing I'd like to ask today is permission from the select board. Uh, when Brian calls me and asks me to lower speeds in an area that there's complaints, that I'm allowed to remove that 25 mile per hour sign. Because again, it does me no good to sign anything if your signs are up because they're not going to listen to mine. But back to using the roads, we'd love to get down Railroad Street and connect to the other side. Uh, the president, Shannon Fredericks, and their treasurer, Ellen Fredericks, were at the Morrisville Select Board meeting tonight. We were actually invited to that meeting by the select board because they are asking us what it would take for us to go into their village because they want us in the middle of Morrisville. They want us right down through to the Bijou, to all the restaurants. So that process was started and enacted by Morrisville. And I would think that our little town here would be jumping all over it to help bring money to this town. Uh, Spencer lives on the other side of the Lamoille River on the other side of Railroad Street. Right. I love to be able to connect. I have friends on the other side who live up in, towards Hyde Park. They would come down here. You know, they spend money on you know, in the restaurant, local stores. I mean, it just, like Cam was mentioned earlier, and, you know, Newport is booming from it, benefiting huge. And I think, uh, you know, that would benefit our town for sure. It was someone who maybe starting in Newport could ride all the way down to here in Johnson and need that downtown or be gas down in here, you know, make a loop. Because usually we start down here and we go up to Newport because we can't access in the town of Johnson here yet. So I think it'd be beneficial for someone starting up in Newport or, you know, up north to come down here and spend money in our town. For sure. And then uh, we have been asked by several other clubs if this is going to happen because they want to come from Newport. They want to come from Charleston. They want to come from Sheffield. They want to come from Montgomery and Bakersfield and uh, all the other areas that we are connected because as of right now, we have about a 300-mile trail system that's connected from Sheffield to Irisburg to Newport to Center, Newport Coventry, Center, Coventry to Lowell. Are you there? Yeah, we, yeah. we lost you for a second. Yeah, we're, we're running out of battery. We've been out here for a while. So I'd really like to see it go to the newspaper, to the grievance. I'd really like to see it moving forward. I know we 
put it off for a long time because of COVID. But as I told Brian, the state, state is slower than you guys. So if I don't get it going, it's not going to happen for another year and a half. So, well, Let me open it up to board members for questions while they're still got some power. So that's a 20 or 10. 20. Okay, go ahead, Mike. I think it's a great idea. Thanks, okay. Mike. Thank you. Uh, Nat, or did you have your hand up? or? No, but I'll chime in. Um, I think it's a, a good proposal. The, the only reservation I have is um, that our, our sheriff's budget um, is with our sheriff's budget. And they um, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on that budget. Um, they're expanding demands and more complicated demands on what they are being expected to to do in the community. Um, okay. And well, just let me finish up. Um, and and really, we're challenged to try and figure out how to continue to provide the service that we're providing. Um, and so, if there are any complaints or anything, um, they're going to have to respond, and that's going to put more pressure on that budget. So that's the only. That's the only reservation I have. Um, I see ATVs on my road pretty frequently. I, I don't have any problem with them. Um, I think uh, they make a good presentation. Uh, as far as the Doug? complaint, oh, go ahead. I, I, I would just like to say, as far as the complaints, I believe, Brian, you might be able to verify this. This has been the only complaint that you know of since we've been on the roads. Uh, yes. The, but I, I think Nance concern was less about specifics complaints that we've had and more the potential for um you know uh, something like the sheriff's department budget where we don't have a lot of direct oversight um okay you know, also, that, it's a more abstract problem than specific complaints if i can hopefully not put words in that's mouth yep and and you guys may not know but vasa uh, we hire Orleans County Sheriff and Caledonia County Sheriffs. We've supplied them with two ATVs to patrol our system. That means the Sheriff's Department, of course, can patrol anywhere in the state. So they patrol all of our trail system. We spent, I, I'm not, don't quote me on it, I'd say around $80,000 last year in our VASA trail system for patrolling. So we, we kick into that budget, and that was just for the sheriff's department. That's not including the patrolling we pay the game wardens to do also. So Orleans County and what county? Orleans County and Caledonia. Caledonia, Caledonia I believe. So would they, if there was a complaint, would they respond to Lamoille County? The, the Orleans County Sheriff's Department has a side-by-side -side that there's two sheriffs on that roll around during the weekends, and they, they stay on the trails the parking spots first weekend we went out we saw them twice and they pulled in right behind us they checked their tags made sure we were all legal and they had no complaints so that they wouldn't respond to this area unless they were here so but again at the same time um we're, we're on many state highways we're on many state highways we're on all kinds of other town roads we're in mm -hmm. hyde park like I said, Morrisville wants us into the middle of Morrisville. We're in Waterville, Bakersfield, Eden, Hyde Park, and Johnson. That's my area as trail master. And again, we don't have many complaints. And when we do, the Sheriff's Department generally contacts us personally, and then we, we tend to take care of it. We go speak to a landowner that has an issue. We apply more signs. When Brian calls me, we run right out and we apply more signs. Um, I don't see how it could be, you know, much different than if it was a car was going down railroad street a little fast and got pulled over, in my opinion. But well, I, I appreciate it, and I, I think you, you all are, uh, you, what you've done has been really community minded, especially around, um, as you said, the work you did around Class Four roads, and um, that if there is a concern that you guys are responsive, I, I appreciate all that. You're a very and, responsible group. Well, Doug, we appreciate that because a lot of people don't tell us that. So, right. Doug, did you want to uh, pipe in? I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Ken, what the estimate is of uh, 
the the number of a, of UTVs or ATVs that would be using you know like railroad speed. Uh, um, what, what sort of I don't know how you estimate that or what period you use. I I don't know if I could estimate that, Doug. You know, uh, this year especially, there's been a great influx in ATVs due to COVID. Everybody was stuck home. Everybody staycationing, and they bought ATVs and found out what a wonderful time they can have in their own state. So. I, w I would say on an average day, like I told you, going to Jolly's, there was approximately 10 to 15 at the most on an average weekend during the weekdays. It's minimal. Um, now, at the same time, you could have 100 show, show up on a big ride or something. You know what I mean? I'm not going to tell you that wouldn't happen. But at the same time, that 100 could also spend thousands in the town. So, I mean, uh, me and Spencer – have we've done groups of 10 12 buggies and we leave from Eden and go to Newport because there's nowhere else to go to eat down this way or you know we'll go to east side and they love us we right. go to the tavern they, they love us carriage house, in orleans. carriage house in orleans they see us pull in they let us come right in they they it's treat us like it's to the point where we call the owner we tell them they're coming they're like we can't wait to see you you know because we're dropping 12 of us we're dropping almost 500 dollars worth of stuff you That's go to Cajun too, I'm sure. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes, we do. That's yeah, just going. I mean, look at that place. I mean, it's unbelievable that. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's no, not all counting the, time. The, the ice, the soda, the water, the gas that we buy. Right. And and also just to let you know that we also, you know, we're giving back to the community all, all the time. Um, I don't know if any of you knew that we filled your town truck trailer full on Green Up Day. We did seven roads in the town of Johnson with just our group. And picked about 30 bags of trash. Yeah. And a recliner. So, a dozen so we, we, we are actively involved in our town. We just want to be included in everybody else's inclusion, you know. We passed the no, uh, all-inclusive ordinance recently, if I'm not correct. Um, and I feel we should fall under that. And I think the town would greatly benefit from us being in there. So I'd really like to see it go to the grievance process, to the newspaper, and and really just keep it moving, knowing that it could still take me a year to get through the state. So, and and also we're all volunteers; not one of us get paid to do this. So, Carl, do you have anything you'd like to add or ask? Yes, I do. Thanks. Um, thanks, guys, for being here. Um, and as a as a Main Street business owner, I, um, I definitely appreciate business. So that's, that's great. Um, th what I wanted to bring up tonight was just safety, um, concerns of safety for you all, because as you know, our Main Street is known for speeding. And um, so I worry about your safety, but I also worry about um, fellow driver safety and pedestrian safety. We have a lot of people that walk and cross uh, Route 15 on Main Street, as well as on Railroad Street. There's a lot of families, there's a lot of pets. There's, you know, just a lot of bikers now that have to share the road um, and the sidewalks with cars and other folks. So, um, so I don't have a necessarily a specific question, but I guess just how, how if we can start to visualize how this is all going to work um, so, from a safety point of view. Okay, so, so as far as safety, uh, 25 miles an hour is nothing for an ATV these days. They're capable of doing speeds of most of your cars, which we aren't allowed to do. Um, State of Vermont, July 1st passed helmet requirement full coverage insurance requirement. So anybody under the age 18 has to be accompanied, pass a safety course like VAST to be able to drive it, has to be accompanied by a adult of 18 years or older. And only people 12 years of age on a 90cc machine can ride on trail systems, they cannot ride roads. So you're talking mostly adults who have $20,000 machines who are pretty safe most of the time. Uh, I don't know if there's any been any serious ATV accidents in Lamoille County is that I can remember recently. Uh, I could be mistaken, but I don't remember of any. We could easily post 15 miles an hour with your permission 
again, we'd have to be asking the state to use the section of 15. Mm -hmm. So uh, we pull out in the 50 mile an hour areas all the time and the state tells us to do 50. So the safety issue isn't really a big issue. Um, we drive through woods at 25 miles an hour, dodging trees, squirrels, deer, bear, you know what I mean? So we could easily, we have good vision. It's no different than driving a car these days. Cause no most, of them, most of them are side by side, not an ATV. Doug still rides an ATV. Doug, you could drive down Main Street without any issue, couldn't you? Uh, I think so. Okay, so. I guess I'm wondering, you know, I'm, sorry, could I keep going just for a second here? Yeah, go um, ahead, Carl. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm thinking, okay, so you're driving down Route 15, a pedestrian needs to cross, um, I, you know, you, would you follow similar rules where you would stop, like, you sure. know, cars are supposed to let people cross? Absolutely. We have working brake lights. Um, we do follow our hand signal procedures. We follow road rules. Road rules, so, yeah. I mean, I mean, look at the, they're, they're rolling down Main Street in Newport. That's right. And there's a lot more pedestrians crossing the street. There's more quite, traffic. But if you put more businesses on Main Street, Newport, there's more traffic, there's more people, and there hasn't been any accidents up there at all. And they've been open all season. And yeah. those guys aren't only going down Main Street. Newport's open all the way up pretty much to Walmart. I don't know if anybody's been up there to Walmart, but that's all open. I went there the other day. And again, <laughs> we, we appreciate your concerns, but at the same time, there hasn't really been any ATV incidents in our area, and we use quite a bit of road. So, yeah, I guess I just think about you know increased traffic always increases the odds. So I'm just I'm, I was just wondering about that. The other thing I was wondering about is just noise pollution, um, and wondering how loud these ATVs are because obviously you know um, people live on Main Street, a lot of people live on Railroad Street, and I'm just. I'm just they, curious about are, the quality of life. They are quieter than a Harley Davidson. They are quieter than the loud trucks that go by. It's mostly a different sound because of our semi off road tires kind of make a little bit of a hum. But at the same time, say, I, you know, you allowed us to, if we were using Railroad Street, I would suggest we set it at a 15 mile per hour. And then you have an ATV idling down the road, making hardly any noise. And I don't, I don't really see how that would be an issue. I'm sure there would be a few people that it would bother. But again, it, it, at the beginning, it's just a different sound. It's not any noisier or louder. Right. Okay. Thank also, you. Also, real, also, real quick, we're only allowed to have stock mufflers. So it's, it's under the decibel limit that the state allows. Okay, oh, thank you. Oh, okay, uh, as you, you all know, this was approved by the voters at town meeting. There's a few ways we could do this. We could go the, the formal process, redoing our ordinance, which would require hearings, uh, require us voting on it. It would take some time to go in effect, allowing voters to raise a petition, that whole process. Or we could... Uh, potentially do a, a waiver of our current ordinance just to see how it works out. And then uh, we wouldn't have to go through the, the exact same process undoing it if, if we deemed that it wasn't working out. So there's a, couple, there's a couple different ways that we could do this. I'm not sure what the board's thoughts are. Can we open it up to public comment first or no? Yeah, we can. I was just trying to get a sense from the board okay. which way they might want to go with this. Or do you have an opinion yet? I'd like to hear public comment. Okay. Well, Brian, let's open it up for public then. Okay. Uh, Lottie, I've got you up first. Go ahead, Lottie. Yeah, um, I live on Clay Hill and I spend Friday, Saturday, Sunday listening to ATVs all day. Um, it's large groups of them coming through. It's a new, it's, it's not fun to hear it all weekend long. Um, and I think it really affects the quality of my time off and, and, you know, our neighbors, um, we have na we have neighbors that live or friends that live on Gould Hill and we hear them, you know, they complain about hearing them late at night around nine thirty, ten o'clock when their kids are asleep. Um, it's, you know, it, there's, 
I, I, you know, no matter what, if you have a speed limit, they're still speeding up the road. Um, so I don't see that changing for railroad street um, necessarily. I think you're gonna deal with a lot of noise and on top of all the traffic that we're already dealing with. So uh, that's just my opinion. Thank you, Lottie. We have anyone else, Brian? I've got Rob. Okay, Rob, go ahead. Uh, I was in Newport last weekend on my uh, motorcycle and <clears throat> it was really busy up there. And there was, I mean, I rode, <clears throat> I came into Newport at the end of the lake there. I rode all the way over through Derby Center and there was cars, ATVs, motorcycles, we were all riding together. I didn't think there was any problem. I mean, everybody followed the rules of the road. It was, it was fine. I, I think it's a good deal. I, I would do it. Thank you, Rob. Thanks. Uh, I think I saw Spencer, or somebody raising their hand there. So I'm going to unmute you guys again. Nope. Yeah. So we'd be happy to do a trial period, you know, to, we'd be more than happy to show you we can do it if that's what you know what it would take and at the same time we'd be happy to gather all the johnson residents that were more for it and come to agreements here either way uh, we just feel that we can bring money into this town this town's starving right now and i'm sure all of you know that because i haven't even gotten my tax bill yet so <laughs> don't worry it, it'll no, come. i'm sure i'm sure it's coming <laughs> don't worry i know it's, and it's probably not going down either, so. Let's, let's hope it does. Yeah. As, as far as the lady that was on Clay Hill, uh, you could call me at any time, 730-3292. And with the town's permission, I'd be happy to slow the speed down on that road. Do we have anyone else, Brian? Uh, I don't have anybody else with their hand up. Uh, Kylie commented uh, that she likes this as a way to bring more business to the downtown. Um, Rob in chat said much the same that he said uh, when he, he commented and Marla had said that uh, she was in Newport recently and had the same a similar experience to Rob that um, that they were sharing like cars and they were doing a good job of sharing the road. Okay. Is there, is there a trail curfew? Um, most, most, uh, there's no VASIT trail curfew, but we go by Johnson's ordinance in the town. So it's, uh, I believe, what, 10 o'clock during the week and 11 o'clock Friday and Saturday, if I'm not correct. Um, Hyde Park copied your ordinance and did the same thing in their area. But we would also be happy to have a curfew on Railroad Street during the trial period. Uh, we did that. We did that on Silver Ridge Road to get to Max Store and to get to the Sunset Motor Lodge because they are our trailhead. People come from out of state to stay there and then ride. So we had a curfew in, on state on uh, Silver Ridge Road till 8 p.m. the first year. The second year, the town of Morrisville said we were great and let us go to their normal noise ordinance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we have another comment, yeah, a couple in chat, um, you know, uh, somebody suggesting as long as the ATV crew is a good neighbor, uh, that shouldn't be a problem. I think that's, uh, Shane, if I'm reading that right, that's kind of an endorsement of the trial period of, you know, let, let's give them an opportunity to be a good neighbor and move on from there. Uh, Beth Foy agrees, and then uh, Dee LaHoulier is asking how you would get to downtown. Um, so from Gould Hill is uh, one way that includes some of the town property and uh, uh, your own trail network that you've built with private landowners. I'm less sure of what your trail network looks like near Railroad Street. As of, as of right now, we would assume Gould Hill would be our best area to come down through because we felt asking to be able to use railroad street 
at the same time, wouldn't be a great idea to ask to come down through by the college. So for our, for our, to be able to use our trail that comes out across from Jolly, then we need to ask you to come from Jolly store all the way to Maple Fields, which I thought would be more of a burden. So that would be entirely up to the residents and you guys as to what, how our access could be here. But coming from Gould Hill down through the railroad street, if that's the main route necessarily, because a lot of people can get gas at Jolly. So it's just going to be a different flavor to be able to get to the other end of town. But that would be our shortest route. So that was every time I try to get access to stuff, I try to use the shortest route through a town as to not bother people. So basically, you'd be looking for from the town access on Gould Hill and Railroad Street, and then you'd have to get the states okay to go up Route 15 to Maple Fields or what have you. Yes, sir. That's, what, that's why I kind of wanted to get it going, because even if you say, okay, we'll do a grace period and try it, it's going to take me, on an average, three to six months to get the state to do their paperwork and to give me the permit. Okay. Would you be looking for a permit from the state to get to Moog's place? We would love to, but again, I don't want to ask for everything. You know what I mean? I want to prove to you each time. And I think we did when we asked to come down railroad street to subway. And now that we lost that and you know, and then to come down through to ghoul Hill, cause we asked for part of clay Hill to ghoul Hill. And, uh, and I've knocked that down to a 15 mile an hour zone with some fancy big yellow and black, slow sensitive area signs and I think for the most part besides maybe one time there was a smaller issue and the guy called me and it was more about dust on the drag lot road so. okay I'll throw it back out the board do you want to look at doing a full ordinance change or just do a waiver to see how it works out Waiver in a trial period. The same. Nat? Yeah. How long would the waiver be for? Well, if they did, if they got to wait three to six months to uh, get state approval, I guess we're looking at next year's season. Yes. Yes, we are. That, that, that is what I told Brian, and that's kind of why I wanted to get on. However, for you to give us the permission to do the trial period that will start next season if you do it. Uh, you do need to sign the state use paper that I presented Brian the last time on May 16th. Uh, so I can get the permit process started. Right. Kyle? And, oh. Sorry, yeah, so if we did this trial period um, and if we feel like this is it's working well, then we'll go to changing our ordinance, correct? And if True. we don't, then what do we do? We say this is we're hearing lots of complaints, whatever it might be. If we're hearing complaints, it's not working for us. We then go we back just, to nothing. Yeah, we'd pull the waiver and then it'd be back to the current ordinance. Okay. Correct. Because our our club wouldn't have to involve any money in using your road besides signage. So that, you know, if you gave us the opportunity to prove to you that we could do it, you wouldn't have to pull it. Good. So uh, maybe uh, we'll look for a waiver for next season because they, they won't be ready to get state approval until then. Is that what the board's thinking? Yeah. Okay. Again, I would... I would need you guys to sign the state road use permit yep. to start the process. Is that a full board signature or uh, just a... Uh, last time you signed it, Eric. Okay. We so, might authorize you to do that. Right, I might yeah. want authorization. What's the board's pleasure? Move to authorize you to sign that. A motion, do we have a second? Lacking a second, the motion dies. I'll second. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Any, any discussion? Sorry, I missed how how long this waiver would go for. It'd be for next season. 
And what's next season again? Sorry. Uh, what is it? May, May, May 15th till November 1st. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? Uh, the only thing I wanted to continue to ask was about the being able to remove the town speed limit sign when I'm requested to lower the speed limit. Um, I, I could either put them back up on a different sign that doesn't have them or return them to the road commissioner. And you're talking about those little ATV signs, correct? Yes. Like I said, Brian asked me to put 15 miles per hour on Hoag Road. And yeah. it does me no good when your guys' sign's sitting above it because generally everybody's going to believe your sign over my sign. Right. So. Don't we have a problem there? I mean, I, I'm, I'm with him on that, with Ken on that, but we, that's probably built into our ordinance. Our ordinance is, is kind of outdated. Uh, I believe that the statewide AT, uh, club wanted to have responsibility for fewer roads. There's a question about how people who live on roads that are not authorized can get to trails, roads that are authorized use, but our, that's, a, that's an ordinance issue. The 20 the speed limit so are, are you thinking how to do it but uh, I I think I might agree with Doug on this I think it, we might need to look at our ordinance before we grant or deny permission on that I think that that one might need I, I just don't think I know what the answer to that question is off offhand I'd like to be able to say yeah let's just authorize him to do this but uh, now, I'm not talking about taking all your signs down. I'm talking about uh, Brian asked me to lower the speed limit in a residential area on Hoag Road because there was a complaint. So I'm, I'm out there putting 15 mile per hour signs out there doing what Brian asked me to do. And at the same time, your speed limit that you set with the ordinance, I'm, talk, I'm for 25 isn't that fast. But we're happy to slow stuff down, but it does mean no good to sign it with a 15 mile per hour sign if the town road is 25. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, if I got a call from the town manager asking me to do that, I would feel that I should be able to take down the one sign at the beginning of Hoag Road where the speed limit sign is, replace it with a 15 on the sign that we supply, and then I could bring you that one sign. Not saying I would do it to any other roads because I feel 25 is a safe speed on any road. No, I agree. I, I wish I wish I knew there was a way to do that, but I think that Brian's story is not authorized to tell you to cut that to 15. So, so I should go remove my signs and have a resident mad at me, and then call in the town again complaining for a simple a simple fact that. We all know it's still 25, but if that sign's gone, they may listen to my signs. That's all I'm getting at. Go ahead, so I'm not I'm I think Go ahead, you know, Ken brings up a, a valid point and he's trying to do the right thing for us, but it's unclear with the ordinance. It's also kind of a separate issue from what's at hand. So let's deal with what's on the agenda tonight and then have Brian look into that, how to do that properly so that we can address complaints. Good properly. suggestion. Yeah. Good point. We do it. Can I can get in touch. I leave my signs up for right now, and you and I will get in touch. We'll be in touch before the next select board meeting and have an answer. Okay, yeah, that sounds uh, good. We'll have it for the board to make a decision on one way or the other, but yeah. I think I, I think I need to review the, our ordinance um, to make sure that we're acting properly. Again, just to make it clear, I'm not trying to change all the roads. Nope. It was just it was right. just an issue yep. from yep. a couple of the residents that lived on there. We understand. Yeah, and, and uh, I appreciate. We do most on the floor. We do have a motion on the floor authorizing the chair to sign the uh, what did we call it? Uh, state waiver. road use permit. Not the waiver. The state road use permit. Is there any more discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. Aye. Those, those opposed? The ayes have it. Congratulations. Thank Great you. Great job and, of presentation. And, and Brian, Brian's story has that paperwork. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Brian, you'll be in touch with me? Yeah, we'll talk soon, Ken. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.
dilapidated buildings. All right. So uh, before we kind of shut everything down for COVID, we were ramping up to uh, take a crack at enforcing our dilapidated building ordinance. And one of the requests we had was uh, to review with the listers what some of their observations and they had any data or recording that might be relevant to us. And one thing that they did have is uh, they do make a note when they review a property of its percent complete. So a property that is uh, substantially under construction. Uh, this isn't making a judgment on when that construction or whether it's active construction or what's going on with it. Uh, so this isn't perfect, but if we started and I uh, we've highlighted here, uh, buildings that are 50% or less complete, um, that might be a pretty good idea of buildings that we should take a look at. Um, then uh, we have buildings that are coded for salvage uh, as another characteristic that's recorded in the listers data. And so the, those are kind of two data sets about buildings in Johnson that we can use as starting points for reviewing buildings that might need attention under our dilapidated building ordinance. Um, I think it would do us well to kind of carry that out. We can, you know, uh, pick one or two. I'll go out with Tracy and we'll run through the ordinance with a, a property owner, owner and kind of put it through its paces and develop our own training and experience on how to apply it. So the ones that are percent complete, like you said, that's just a, a reference in time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They may be uh, under active construction, maybe not. Yep. The, the other the list is not making a judgment call on whether they think a person's going yeah. to complete construction or how it's going or anything else. It's just, that's most, that's something that's being reported to them of, that it's not going for salvage, that it is a building that somebody's working on. And the salvage ones are ones that are abandoned, empty? The criteria oh. on that, I'm a little bit less clear on what makes something salvage. I just looked up one of the salvage ones for the Vermont Studio Center. That's actually the building on Pearl Street that they're rebuilding or reconstructing. So there's more to it than in many, some cases at least, than this is just an empty dilapidated building. Yes, uh, the, the listers do not have any list that would be sufficient for us to say, this is all the data we need and we can definitely go and enforce it at, like that we can just go right after it. I think that part of our process is going to be learning to use these data sets and translating them to kind of on the ground, you know, materials. So if we can go and look and say like, okay, this is, um, you know, these are buildings that need a little bit more attention and that we're going to spend a little bit more time looking at. Yep. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think that's, that's it that, that we're going to start enforcing and we're going to use these as our criteria for, you know, at least at first it's going to be people that show up on, on these lists. So and we will not get to all of them in any particular order, uh, a period of time, but we'll, we'll start here. I wonder if we shouldn't start by publishing information on our ordinance and 
in bringing, because this has been languishing for a while. It, it's, it's not been used. And uh, I, I think we ought to give the public notice of it. And then I'd be interested in the process when you think you're going to visit someone, you send them the, the ordinance first. Or, or if you have enough interest in, in actually visiting with them, you send them the ordinance and say you'd like to talk about this. I think that sounds good. Mm -hmm. You know, that we can do a little informational push on, you know, beyond just this meeting providing some notice, we can do a little bit more informational push on that we're going to be enforcing this and so we're going to be making contact with people that we want to conduct visitations with and assessments of. Um, and then uh, pick a few properties, send them, uh, send them copies of the ordinance and ask to set up a meeting. You know, that I would very much like to run through this with people that are, especially for the first couple of times, I'd like to run through it with people who are active participants and, and willing to kind of work with us. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, we lost one of our dilapidated buildings. Yep. The old sergeant yeah. house. Yeah, we did. And the okay. main house is under construction. What'd you say, Doug? I think the uh, May house at the corner of the plot road. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's going to yeah. be yeah. brought back palatially. Yeah. That's why this list is a little bit deceiving, because that particular house, the May house, uh, that's actively being yeah. you know, remodeled. but. But it's something for you to start with anyways. Yeah, we have to have some criteria that we yeah. that we use to decide where to go. And this is this is a pretty good method. Uh, I think that it gives us an objective standard uh, to use to select people that we're going to visit with and, and talk to. Now, were you the one that was authorized to be the enforcement of this ordinance or had we designated uh, I have to check, but I believe that it is myself and Tracy as our constable and uh, Diane as our second constable. Okay. That I believe the enforcement extends to constables and not just myself. And, or health officers or both? Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyone got anything else on that? If not, good luck. Thank you. Uh, formation of the study law enforcement option. So uh, we've seen uh, we we've seen a lot of growth in our uh, law enforcement, our patrol budget uh, with the sheriff's department, and we had talked to Roger. Uh, and uh, the other towns that use Lamoille County Sheriff and had decided that we should, uh, you know, based on comments at town meeting and everything else, we should have a, a study of um, what are our alternatives and what do the, what's the cost and benefit of uh, a variety of different alternatives. Mm -hmm. You know, state police, uh, intermunicipal force, uh, local law enforcement uh, we, we should just we should have a study that that looks at this and has a kind of big picture view for us um this has been kicking around for a little while and uh we're going to lose our opportunity to have anything to report on before town meeting if we don't start actively working on it so i would like to post uh, membership uh, request for volunteers for this on uh, our regular front porch forum and town website and uh, so, and solicit membership. Right. Now, was, I was just going to ask, maybe Nat, you can answer this. Was this going to be in conjunction with Hyde Park and Wolcott or was it we were going to do it on our own? No, this is a this is two members from each 
um, from each contract town. Okay. So we've, I've, we've talked to the select boards in um, Hyde Park and Wolcott about this and agreed on language that this committee would be to study options for maintaining quality law enforcement coverage in a fi financially sustainable way. Um, so that's the, the charge of the committee. And, and this is also something that we agreed um, with Roger to do in exchange for him capping his budget increases for the next two years. Yep. At three percent. Okay, are we uh, behind the ball, eight ball on this or ahead or on track with reference to the other towns? Oh, probably ahead, but overall, um, okay. you know, this came up in March and then everything, uh, excuse me, this came up at our last, this, we agreed to do this at, in our select board meeting in February and then, you know, everything changed with COVID and everything right. kind of delayed. So, um, yeah, I, I haven't, I don't know where Woolcott and Hyde Park are at with this, but okay, you can lead them. I think that would be good. I think it's going to take somebody taking the lead on this to get it going again. Okay. And yeah, we can ask for volunteers, and then when we get our volunteers, we can help the other towns get their volunteers and get a, the group group uh, rolling. Perfect. Any board member thoughts? Questions? We need to start. Okay. So you're going to post the openings and uh, go from there. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Zoom okay. licen licensing. So uh, Zoom licensing, we are Currently, we are paying uh, a pretty good amount for our, uh, our Zoom license that we're using here. And in particular, most of that money is going for a feature that we don't really use. Um, that most of our money goes for uh, the ability to, uh, sorry, uh, uh, most of that goes for an ability to use, to have up to 500 simultaneous uh, connections, so 500 simultaneous users connecting and uh, participating in meetings. We, if we uh, give up that, we'll save $50 a month and we can still have 100 simultaneous users connecting at once. And that we have only broken a hundred users a couple times. Um, so I don't think we're really going to lose much functionality uh, if we, we give that feature up. Mike? What is the breakdown on uh, users? Does it go like a hundred, 150, 200? How does that work? It goes 100 to 500 to a thousand. Oh, no kidding. Well, wow. You would think they'd break that down a little bit more. Yeah. Now, if we could pay, you know, if we could get 200 simultaneous users, that would be perfect for us. You know, because we've broken 100 a couple times, but we've never even gotten close to 200. So what's the deal if you uh, go over, if we lock in at 100 and uh, let's say, 120 people want to go on. What happens to the 20? They just can't get on? Yes. Okay. Well, that might be a problem sometime. I, I, that's where I would go with Mike is that could be a problem while we're not having in-person meetings because we're certainly having more participation with the Zoom. After we have in-person meetings, I don't see a need to be you know, have the 500. Right. That's a good idea. Probably once we go back to in-house meetings, it, it won't be much of an issue. Yeah. But uh, we're looking at the 1st of August timeframe, having another 
uh, Zoom broadcast, community Zoom broadcast with NVU and uh, Vermont Studio Center to explain their process and protocols they're, they're going through for the incoming students and residents. And then they'll be available for questioning uh, Q&A. So that might be over 100 people. I could very easily see that. What were the two meetings that were over 100? Uh, one of them was, that it was when Representative Welch joined us and the first meeting we had about the uh, NVU. NVU. Okay. How changeable are these? Can you, if you have a subject that you think is going over, can you, can we up the license fee easily? In advance, very easily. In the moment of we have 99 users and realize that we need to up the license, pretty difficult. You know, that was how we were able to up it without any interruption very easily. Uh, and I don't remember which of those two meetings came first, but I think it was the NVU meeting where we thought, you know what, I think we're going to get a lot of people and we really don't want to have to turn anybody away. So let's buy more, more users. And the, the, the process for that is very easy. Well, it doesn't sound like we should do this before the uh, meeting that's coming up with regard to NVU and the uh, studio center. Uh, we are good up through, uh, I believe it's August 18th or 19th is the next time our, our, we just completed a billing cycle. So we've got almost, we're a couple days short of a full month to make the decision. So we're talking about a savings of 50 bucks a month. Yeah. But the potential could be somebody would be blocked out from joining our Zoom broadcast. if we're not good at predicting. Right. I don't think $50 is a killing affair. Really, if we have something that's really interesting and people want to weigh in, I think we have been proactive in trying to make sure that everybody wants to participate can. So we should maybe leave it another month beyond August. What's the rest of the board's thoughts? I agree. Yeah, I'm for leaving it as is. Okay. I think that's the way we'll do it, Brian. All right, sounds good. Discussion on membership of a committee of racial justice. This was actually something I was gonna bring forward and suggest we think about. Uh, and this is not something I had come up with on my own. This was something that Crassberry put in place, as you may or may not have read in the News and Citizen. They were having a, one protest for uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter and a counter protest, and it got a little bit uh, dicey. And that was something that came out of it is to start this committee and from all indications, they have indicated that uh, it's working very well. All of the parties are there talking. And this is something that Cambridge is looking into. They're wanting to get ahead of it. They're really not at that point that Crassberry was. Uh, they're just starting to have some uh, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protests. And they so they wanted to get ahead of it a little bit. And, and possibly get something together like this. I think we're probably somewhere in between Crassbury and uh, uh, Cambridge. I, I guess the concern I would have is where the flashpoint is in the sense that I'm getting that there's te tension and anxiety building in the community. And it's not just with the Black Lives Matter. We have the whole COVID-19 and there's a lot of tension and anxiety from people with that the wearing the mask, not wearing the mask, uh, just the whole COVID-19 environment that we're in. And some, a lot of people have anxiety there. 
uh, the effects of the COVID-19 on the economy, that is causing some real stress on some folks that are, you know, not uh, or unemployed, not working, and uh, and having a real stress effect there. The uh, you know with the protests that are going along on, and we haven't even headed into uh, the election cycle yet, which I'm anticipating is going to be very contentious. I'm, I've just got a concern with uh, where the flashpoint is of where we could have something happen and something not good. Um, we have had a individual contact us on a business that was on social media saying racial uh, slurs and, and uh, and racial harassing, I guess you could say. And they wanted us to condemn them and boycott them. And it's a, a business in Johnson. I know the owners personally, and I was, I just, it's not what you would think of from them. After doing a little bit of investigating, it came to be that the business has a exact same business name and it's a person in Maine who was doing the, uh, uh, all of the racial uh, uh, postings on uh, media. So there is some tension out there. We had a person call us that they observed, they believed a noose hanging over one of our highways. Um, they thought it was in order to, to call select board members and leave a message. Unfortunately, by the time I got the message, got back with them, asked them if they had notified the sheriff, they had not. And in that amount of time, whatever they may have seen or may not have seen was nothing there that the sheriff could observe. They did go and investigate. There were some ropes hanging, but they were old ropes that look like maybe from a swing or something like that. And, uh, and the caretaker came along and said the ropes had been there for years. So it, it didn't turn out to be anything. Not really sure what the individual did or didn't see, but obviously uh, they should have re reported at the sheriff's office in the beginning. So that's some of the background of some of my concerns and why I think that there's a lot of stress and anxiety in the community. And if we're not careful, there's gonna be a flashpoint. And I think maybe having a group of people, a committee get together and talk about some of these issues, they could take up a lot of these issues that we've been dealing with um, and flush them out and bring forward the recommendations to the board. We've been, uh, the last two meetings dealing with some kind of a, a uh, racial justice issue. Uh, we got more items on tonight's meeting and I anticipate that unless we do something, it's gonna continue. And we don't have the luxury of spending the time on these issues that they really deserve. And I think a committee that's a balanced committee and able to talk it through would do a much better job than we could do. And I guess that's where I'll leave it. That's my, that's my suggestion that we uh, consider forming a racial justice committee. I'll open it up to board members. Um, I, I guess I'll talk next, if that's okay. Go ahead, Kyle. Um, so I think, yeah, I think this is a good idea. Um, but I will say that I do think that we've been doing a great job as a board and a community also um, in talking about these difficult topics and staying civil and neighborly and um, respectful. Um, What you just outlined, Eric, sounded like a lot of different things. You said some racial stuff, but then you talked about COVID and you talked about MVU. So 
I think it's important we get clear what we're, our expectations of this committee are. Um, and yeah, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm also curious as to what exactly you're fearful of. I'm fearful of something like what happened in Crassbury, a confrontation between two groups. Okay. And what's and and to the point uh, uh, about you outlined a bunch of different things that are you you claim be you know are um, high stress for people in town. Yeah, yeah. I think the COVID nineteen is an added stress um, for the community. A lot of community members. Uh, the just the economy is a stressor for certain individuals. And just the combination of, in this committee, I didn't see as someone that would be dealing with COVID-19 or the, the economy or anything like that, but just the combination of all these stressors. I mean, I can see where somebody's gonna do something maybe that's not smart. And uh, you know, if we can get ahead of it and prevent it, I think that that's the best thing for the community. Thank you. Thank you. So you you know what the charge was for the uh, the Crashbury uh, committee? You know, are they are they dealing locally? Are they dealing statewide? Uh, do they get to comment on political or matters? What you know, and to to what extent do they have their they are they answerable or or subject to like our planning commission to our accepting or not accepting their recommendation i certainly don't like to appoint people who i can't you know, you know i don't want to overthrow what they're what they're saying you like to give them authority and and they do their best job and if you can you really want to accept it I guess I would envision that we would have that power to whatever kind of a committee we wanted to set up. And I really can't answer to all of those kind of questions with Crassbury. It's just what I read in the paper as well as most uh, anybody else could have. How many members? How many members? I'm asking you. Some of this depends on um, community interest and, and um, who steps up and, and how many people want to be involved. Um, I will say, um, I'd like, and I'd like to kind of, uh, maybe this would be the first charge of the, of the committee, but to um, know or, or have some understanding of precisely what the mission of the group is um and you know what i've been observing and seeing in the community is um, um really conversation hard conversations that need to happen but people who are in both directions in all directions talking through each other and not to each other not tr not really doing the work to um, really build those, build bridges to understanding. Um, and so I'd like the, if, if this were to be a, a committee, I, I would really like it to, one of its charges to emphasize, emphasize um, strengthening connections between people, effective communication, not just jumping to answers and solutions, but really um, talking also about how we get to a more um, equitable and um, just uh, community. Um, that's all. Thank you. Mike, Doug, you guys have any thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm wondering the, 
is the charge how we in Johnson get to a, a just community? Does this committee address our, our should they have a member on, on our sheriff's contract committee? You know, is, is that part, I'm, I'm hearing a lot about policing and changing, changing policing. Um, I guess I'm interested in the, in the mission, and I, I, I've seen a, a lot of uh, response and from people who I think would are talented and would would be happy to serve on this committee. But I don't think that there's a I don't think there's a countervailing uh, group to to have a conversation with that would come forward. It, it seems to me that for Nat's dialogue, you need to have you need to have both you need to have a number of sides, you know. And I think that this would be a, a choir of bases or altos or something, or it'd be our duty to see that it wasn't. I would agree. We would want a very diverse uh, committee membership, or there would be just everybody looks the same, talks the same, is the same. That's a good point, Eric. I mean, we did, we were successful. And when we had the inclusivity statement, having people come together and, and, uh, and actually finally did come to a, a place where everybody felt comfortable with it. I'd like to hear from the public. If there's no further board members that want to say anything, Brian, is there anybody from the public who would like to chime in? Yep, I've got a couple of comments from chat, but uh, Shane has his hand up, so we'll go to Shane first. Okay, Shane, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Can you all hear me? Yep, yep. go ahead, Shane. Right, good. Um, I think Eric and Nat both hit it right on the head uh, separately. Um, I thought Eric's comments about some of the stresses in the community and, and specifically, um, you know, some of the, the division around this particular issue are something that we should absolutely keep in mind as we're moving forward with this. Um, and Doug actually had a very good point as a way to mitigate those stresses, making sure that there is a, you know, a wide range of voices. But to Nat's point, making sure that they are people who can communicate with each other and who can, uh, you know, come out of the room with some sort of understanding that we're all good people with, you know, the best interests of Johnson at heart. Um, I think that's very important because this is a contentious issue. And, you know, it's something that I think people can easily get very, you know, emotional and fired up about as well they should. Um, but it's also important that, you know, we're all members of the same community and we're all, we're all trying to pull for the same things at the end of the day. So. That's just my two cents. Thank you. Okay. Uh, from chat, Beth uh, says that she likes the idea uh, that we could be educators, mediators, and uh, generate ideas around challenging situations to make recommendations to the board. Uh, Reg supports this, uh, saying that we're trying to be proactive. Um, Rick Opperly says uh, that we have a publicly mandated inclusivity statement and that the select board is the committee to lead on this issue. Uh, is there anybody else from the audience that wants to speak? Okay. Nobody? Nope. Uh, Greg, you raise your hand and Beth. Okay, so I've got Greg first. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Uh, I'm not sure that people are, that are on these Zoom calls um, actually know what's going on in a lot of the community. And uh, I do think there's a lot of tension. Um, you know, the flag portion is a lot of tension for people. And 
I think this is a good idea. Um, I have an example. I was on the uh, Lake Carmine Watershed Committee when, when all hell was breaking loose over here. And I said, you know, has anybody gone to talk to the farmers? And they said, no, nobody has. And uh, I said, well, why not? They said, well, they don't want to talk to us. And, and I said, well, who tried to talk to them? They said, nobody. So I said, well, I'll go talk to them and uh, to try to bring the community together. Because, you know, farmers at that point over here were, were probably uh, in danger of getting hurt or, you know, just didn't feel right about being in the community. So, and I talked to them. I took Saturdays and I went and talked to every one of them. And you know what? We kind of started healing the community here and we started working together instead of being one sided. And uh, I think this would be a good thing to relieve some of the tensions and get people speaking again. And, you know, we become so split. Our, our town is split. You got the people on the left, you got the people on the right. And, you know, we're losing our community. And, uh, I think this is one way to at least try to get some of it back. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. And Beth. Um, okay, go ahead, Beth. I actually echo a lot of what Greg said. I think that um, we have lost the ability to hear each other and because we're very, feel very strongly and we feel very strongly for the right reasons, right? So everyone who has an opinion has an opinion for a reason. Um, and sometimes it's a well-educated, strong opinion for a good reason. Sometimes it's a not so educated opinion for the wrong reason or the right reason, right? Everyone has an opinion, but if we're not gonna hear each other out and actually have you know, unheated conversations, we can't let that emotion come to the surface of those discussions. Um, or we're never going to get past, um, you know, whatever the boundary is, there's boundaries all over the place. So I think, it, I think that Eric, this is a really, really great opportunity and a great idea. Um, if it's going to be successful, I think it has, we have to reach out to um, strong voices who have all of the different opinions because we're all I think that each person on this call is hearing different voices and some are louder than others. And I think it's really important we get those some of those loud voices on opposing sides, but also some of the softer voice, voices that have really good reasoning behind what they're saying, um, who aren't always heard. Um, and probably most importantly, is that whatever the committee looks like, assuming there is one, um, there needs to be a really strong facilitator who can control the conversation. Um, so I just want to throw that out there because it's very important. There are a lot of stressors right now um, and everyone's stressors are slightly different and we all have them. Um, so uh, thanks Eric for bringing this up. I think it's a extremely important topic and I'm glad you did. Thank you Beth. Anyone else? Uh, yes, Cal Stanton. Okay, Cal, I've got you coming up. Go ahead, Cal. Okay. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, I just uh, just a quick a quick note. I just want to. I hear a lot of folks. Uh, well, first of all, I think you know it's probably a good idea to form this committee. But on another note. I hear a lot of folks talking about um, trouble happening. And divisiveness is a word I've, I've heard a lot around, around the racial stuff. And um, I just want to remind folks that, you know, democracy is sloppy. Um, everything can be divisive, um, whether we're talking about ATVs or racial justice. Now, to me, um, the racial justice is, you know, obviously something we're going to be talking about. Um, but that when we kind of fan the flames, are, are people hearing things? Is that where this is coming from? Or people are just sensing that there, it's tense out there? Because I feel like when, when folks say, oh, something's going to happen, 
you almost will it to happen. And it's almost dog whistly in some way. We're all adults. Well, this is democracy. Democracy is sloppy. Um, if the racial issue, the racial tension issue, it's 2020. Uh, this, it shouldn't be tense at all, but unfortunately it is. Um, I agree we need to come together a community. I trust that our community is, uh, can weather these storms, uh, however it turns out. But I just want to, just a cautionary note that I hear a lot of the uh, inflammatory language and I, and I feel that it's just not helpful to the situation. And I want to trust that we can, uh, we can deal with this much uh, as, a com as a community. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, Shane. Okay, go ahead, Shane. Yeah, hi. I was just hoping I could speak a little bit about that divisiveness and some of what I'm seeing and hearing. Um, for me personally, there is a right and a wrong side of this issue. And I think for a lot of us, there is a right and a wrong side of this issue. The, the issue, as I see it, is that when, you know, let's take a phrase like Black Lives Matter. When some of us say Black Lives Matter, certain people hear it one way and certain people hear it exactly the opposite way. And so when we're talking about, you know, the flags, for example, I, I think what people are worried about is not so much about, you know, some act of violence or anything, you know, a, a civil war breaking out in Johnson. I think what people are worried about is how horrible all of us would feel if we put these flags up and then a week later there was some kind of racially motivated defacement of these flags. And you know, I don't know which community member is going to do it. I don't think any of us are, are hearing from people who are planning on doing anything like this. It's just we've seen what's happened in other towns. We saw what happened in Craftsbury. And, and so, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, a dog whistle or an invitation for anyone to do it. It's, it's an acknowledgement that this could happen and that, you know, we want to be aware of it and we want to we have some way of, of working through it. That's why I think this, this community is a good thing because there are people out there who hear Black Lives Matter and hear something very, very bad from those words for some reason. And I think it is the job of those of us who you know, believe in those words to educate the rest of the community about what it means to us rather than you know, punishing people or, or belittling people for not believing the, the quote unquote right thing in, at this time. Um, Again, I think there's a right and a wrong way to believe on this. I just don't think that there is any value in, in you know, hitting people over the nose with their wrong opinion. So that's all I've got. Thank you, Shane. Do we have anyone else, Brian? Yes, uh, Jackie has her hand up. Okay, go ahead, Jackie. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everybody. Um, you know, when I, I first saw this uh, committee being proposed, I thought, oh man, this sounds great, um, a racial justice committee. I had made an assumption that we were gonna, that it would be about um, racial justice work um, that, that we've already begun in this town um, on several fronts. The most recent um, accomplishment was the uh, implicit explicit bias training uh, that Bo Yang gave us over at the elementary school, and it was really fantastic. So I would love to be a part of an effort to continue work like that. Um, this group, I'm still trying to, I mean, I know that it's still in the kind of formative stage, and I know that people don't have real definitives, but um, from what I'm, I'm hearing, I, I guess the goal of this group is to bring together people who want to do racial justice work and people who don't? I don't, I don't know. I, I can't really understand the goals of this group. It almost sounds a, a bit therapeutic. Um, but is this a group that wants to forward racial justice work, things like workshops, education, films, conversations, presentations? Is, would that be included in a group like this? Thank you, Jackie. It, my impression it would be, but it would be with everybody involved. And not just, just like uh, the Bo Yang training, everybody was invited, right? Everybody was involved. Right. So but I just would see this group as one that would set up some kind of trainings. Would would you know okay. do the well like the uh, proclamations that we have been doing 
they'd be the ones that would be flushing out all of the proclamations and, and coming forward with a recommendation to the select board of one that fits our community. Be more voices. Great, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, Brian? I don't see anyone else. Okay. Well, let me put it before the board then. What are your thoughts? Do we go forward with it? You feel it's a worthwhile endeavor? I, th I, th I think it is. Um, I, as a board, would we put together what the guidelines and the mission are and then, and then look for folks that are interested? That's all, all up for discussion. That would make sense. You know, if I can offer what we've done with something like the beautification committee, uh, we gave the select board gave them a broad directive, then beautification wrote its own mission statement and gave that back to the select board to say, you know, you told us to do this. This is how we're going to accomplish the broad goal that you gave us. And, and the board accepted their mission statement. So, yeah, we could follow the same process here or, or we could establish a different one. I think what you just said is that the board gave the beautification committee the mission and then the beautification committee said how they were going to accomplish it. So the, war, the heavy lifting, I think, is the mission statement defining what they're supposed to do or what we would like them to achieve. One I, one I hear is that we would like to, in racial uh, justice, um, um, bring together our community to have a unified vision, okay? Uh, another thing I hear is that, is that uh, it's to educate those who don't believe a certain way, whose position is different. Um, I, I don't think you'll get, and, and, and I saw Shane put in that, uh, yes, but we need to get, uh, we get, need to get people to participate. I don't know how you get the people to participate when they're feeling they're being preached to. Um, I, I would love to see unanimity in our community on, on this issue, which I think has only one answer, but um, how to get there. I, I think that uh, the uh, example of Lake Carmi consulting with people bringing in, it, it seemed to me that reading the flagpole um, minutes from the trustees led me to believe that you might find opposing member, you know, some some differing views in in the fire department or things like that. You know, there are clearly different differing views or, or reticence. You know, how I think we should do spend some time defining this and then looking for looking for how we get greater participation so as to heal rather than uh, drive apart. Thank you, Doug. So what's the board's pleasure? Do you want to take action on this or do you want to pass over? I, yeah. I, I think we need a little more time to flesh this out. I mean, when I hear racial justice, I think action towards um, towards racial justice, towards towards um, um, making um, taking action steps to make the lives of uh, our marginalized community, our Black folks in our community better. So I, I, I feel like that, that if that's what we're talking about, then that should, you know, that's, that should always be the mission. Um, I, 
So I, I just feel like we need to absolutely kind of be on the same page about what this is about. And I'm, I'm not feeling like, I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm clear on where everyone's at with what this is, what, what this is for, what, what we want the outcomes to be. That's my opinion on where the outcomes could be, but I'm not sure if that's how the rest of the board is feeling. And um, I'd hate to start a group when we're not even clear <laughs> as to what we're, we're trying to accomplish here. Mike? Well, I think if we do have this uh, uh, committee or group or whatever you call it, I think it should be a, a very large participation of all of the people in this community of color uh, to see really exactly how they feel about things. Uh, we don't have a clue uh, what it's like to live in their shoes, so maybe it should be a very liberal amount of people of color in this group. Uh, to hear what they have to say. Thank you, Mike. That would certainly allow us to tailor the committee response to living in Johnson, you know, what what they experience here. They're different levels, you know. Um, 400 years of discrimination doesn't, and, and hesitancy to let people through the gates doesn't leave leave a, a group well sat you know well able and it leaves them punished and isolated. I don't know, uh, but we should ask the people here what we could do here. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, I I I I absolutely agree that if people of color willingly want to join this group, then absolutely, absolutely. However, I don't think that we should be approaching people of color and saying, hey, tell us how, you know, um, do, do what I believe is white people work. We created white supremacy and systemic racism. We need to end it and it's our responsibility. Um, so to put the onus on people of color, I don't think is fair. Um, and we should be very sensitive to that. Um, but of course, open to people of color if they want to be on this committee, but I don't think it should be, you know, I, I, I don't think we should be targeting, so to speak, people of color. I don't think I'm trying to say that, Kyle. I just think that uh, I'd like to hear what their input is, that's all. Right, and I'm saying that, that I, yes, their input is, is important and obviously welcome, but it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be, um, you know, there's a lot of people of color that I don't, I don't think will want to participate for various reasons, very, very legit reasons based on experience and history. Well, it's obvious, Eric, that we have to do quite a lot of thinking on this committee that you brought forward. But we don't need to decide tonight. It was something I wanted to propose. Um, like I said, I just get in a sense that the stress levels in this community are getting to a point that I'm, I don't want to see a flashpoint like Crassberry or something worse. Eric, you mentioned, you mentioned other commi uh, communities that have uh, similar, uh, do they have mission statements for those committees? I don't know. Uh, Crassbury heads this committee. Cambridge was the one that turned me on to it because they're looking into forming the same kind of a committee. They want to know what we were doing, but uh, you know, we weren't doing anything like this. It, it seems like, yeah, we're all kind of driving at a similar thing, which, what is the mission here? And, mm -hmm. and uh, if, if somebody has a template for that in another town, that might help us get started. Yeah. Otherwise, we have to contribute our own ideas and, and mesh it out ourselves, which we'll have to do anyway. But yeah, I can get in touch with a couple of our neighbors. Um, you know, Erica is already in touch with uh, Cambridge. Uh, I think Stowe has attempted something similar also, and we can reach out to Craftsbury too. Yeah, that sounds good. 
Okay. Unless there's any further comments. Uh, Cal has another comment. Uh, okay, Cal, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just, yeah, just um, before we get, before we get too uh, far down the path to comparing us to Craftsbury, I just want to point out that in Craftsbury, there was a peaceful demonstration going on for Black Lives Matter and folks showed up with Confederate flags and guns. So it, I just don't want to draw, I just don't want to draw this, the two sides as equal or equally um, responsible for what happened in Craftsbury. Yes. That's all, thank you. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Rick, properly, um, Rick, I'm going to unmute you. I'm not sure if I uh, understand your question correctly. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Okay, Rick, go ahead. Okay. Um, I guess we have been through the public process of uh, getting an inclusivity statement. And I think we have a board that we elected to be leaders in this community. And I think that what we need is leadership at this point. And I think, I think we need a public statement uh, that affirms the inclusivity statement. We already have the means by which to invite people into the conversation, but first we need to make sure that people know where the board stands on this issue. And I think it's clear. I, I, when you read the first statement, uh, there was no response. There was five seconds of silence. Um, I'm I'm just following up on that, and uh, I'm I'm going to stick to that. I mean, if we've gone through the process at town meeting, and we've even been willing to amend it to include positivity because people felt it was too negative. The conversations going on, it's being had in the community. And if you're afraid of things, then you need to stand up to them. It's the schoolyard bully story. And I think that the board needs to take a stand on this issue for the community, for the whole community, whether it's people of color, uh, or any other marginalized people, whether it be gender orientation or what. Um, and I guess I'll just leave it at that. I, I'd like to see the board take a stand here. Thank you, Rick. Take a stand on exactly what, Rick? S stand up for the inclusivity statement get ahead of this issue instead of worrying about what might happen or what people are threatening. Again, Mike, we, we all grew up and we all had to deal with the schoolyard bully. And if you let the schoolyard bully drive the conversation and you don't get ahead of it, then you're gonna be dealing with the bully. And I guess, Maybe the, maybe the board wants a committee because they don't want to deal with the issue. But you need to because the public gave you a mandate to deal with it. Mm -hmm. yep. I'm all for a committee and I want to be on it 100%. Mm -hmm. But I also think we need leadership here. Mm -hmm. I took a stand during Hydro-Quebec, and that was 30 years ago. And people didn't like it. But Johnson still has the lowest or one of the lowest rates of village utility. And, and we didn't buy into a very expensive, unnecessary power contract. It wasn't a popular idea 30 years ago. But we didn't give in. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I think that this committee, whatever it, whatever shape and form it, it, it takes, can't be in lieu of, of our leadership and it can't, and it also, yeah, it needs to, you know, we, we do have an inclusivity statement already in place. And so it needs to always, you know, come back to that. Okay. Anyone else? If not, I think Brian, you were gonna check in with the uh, see what yeah, some of the statements. We'll look at uh, some uh, similar um, orders that have been given to other committees and, and work on that one. Um, and I, I appreciate your comments, Rick, but I do want to point out that the, the board did adopt. Uh, an anti-racism statement on June 15th uh, that we published, um, you know, that, that our, our board does stand firmly uh, with our, our inclusivity statement and against racism. Uh, and I really do want to commend the board for, for having taken that action early. Um, so there's more to do. And, and I, I get that that's, that's the, the thrust of your statement is that we've got a lot more to do and that it's not just that statement and then we're done. But I definitely want to make sure that we also respect that the board has been working on this and has uh, made a good effort uh, so far. And this is just the, the next step in the process. Uh, so, so thank you for your comments. All right, uh, the next piece is, uh, the statement on Juneteenth, the review and adoption of a Juneteenth holiday proclamation. Uh, so we have the, we have three different proposals before us. Uh, I think we're starting with uh, the original proposal and uh, language that's been updated from the original proposal. Um, well, that's in your packet on page, what was that, page 22. I can share my screen. All right, uh, Shane, with your permission, I'm going to unmute you again. Okay, Shane, uh, so you shared this proclamation with the board and uh, made a couple updates to it. Yeah, so um, Matt and I think uh, maybe Doug as well had raised some concern at the last meeting about um, the inclusion of uh, indigenous and other communities of color um, as part of the language of the original uh, resolution. And so the only change between the original and the second version that you're seeing is the removal of any reference to um, indigenous people or any other communities of color. So uh, I think it's in the, f let me see, the uh, first, I wanna say the first paragraph, there is a change in the first sentence where it used to say, um, Juneteenth is the oldest known celebration commemorating the abolition of slavery in the United States and the emancipation of slaves, including black, indigenous, and other communities of color. Now uh, it just says, and the em emancipation of slaves throughout the Confederate South. Um, and then I think again in the uh, second to last paragraph um, where it says, uh, the town of Johnson, Vermont, wishes to show solidarity and stand with our black, indigenous, and communities of color. Um, it now just says, um, where, where did it go? Uh, with our, yeah, sorry, with our black neighbors by adopting Juneteenth as an official holiday. Um, I also changed, there, there was uh, something in there about um, town holiday 
And I had noticed uh, that I think Diana Osborne had mentioned that there's some specific language, some specific legal language referring to either town holiday or official holiday. So whichever one of those is the, the bad one, um, <laughs> we, we want to avoid. I can't remember which one it was that she said was uh, the one that came with some particular legal definition. Um, but yeah, the only major change is stripping the language about indigenous and other communities of color out of it because the history surrounding that and Juneteenth is much less clear, so. Thank you, Shane. The town would not have the authority to declare an official holiday. Yeah, we could declare a town holiday, but an official holiday, I think, is, is the language we'll, we'd have to avoid. Okay. All right. So I move that we uh, go forward with the uh, revisions on Shane Spence's proclamation, uh, declaring June 19th, Juneteenth Freedom Day in the town of Johnson, Vermont. Can't we hear all the uh, different proclamations that are we're considering first? Well, this was the original proclamation uh, that was brought forth on June 15th. Uh, and you said that I'm Kyle asking, said I'm she's personally in favor of adopting this proclamation tonight. She agrees that this is another good proactive step and not a big ask. So, you know, I just wanted to tidy that up, uh, but I guess if we don't have a second, we'll uh, decide between the two. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I will give it a second for discussion. Yeah, I mean, this is the this is the one that I favor. Um, but in fairness, I'm, you know, put them both out there on the floor before we take an official vote. It seems like maybe that's the more okay. Equitable. Well, both of them are. You referenced three of them, Brian. Uh, the first one was the unedited. Uh, okay. Okay. Proposal. So, so that we're really considering two. Two. Okay. There are three. There are three versions in your packet, but we're really only considering the second two. Okay. So does the board want to hear both of them before making a motion? Or well, we've already got a motion on the floor, but. Uh, I would ask uh, if the board's so inclined, we would have Mike, uh, if he's so inclined to withdraw his motion. Yes, I, I would like to speak to the second one that was asked of me to, to present to the board. All right. Okay, the motion has been withdrawn and that's a, a second withdrawn as well. So the second one is the state of Vermont. Yep. Okay. Uh, so the second one has been adopted by the state of Vermont. Um, let's see. It's been adopted by the House of Representatives. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's Thank a you. Resolution. Yes. Um, adopted by the, the, the House of Representatives, um, and that one is also in your packet. It was adopted by an overwhelming vote. Uh, Kyle, I'm sure you can provide me with the, the actual vote total. Um, I believe it was 127 to 17. That sounds right. Um, and on this one, um, you know, it's a little bit more specific to our current uh, current issues and concerns. Um, you now it's in your packet, so I don't really want to read it out for everybody. But it's a I little... can speak to why I think this is a, a one to consider. Go ahead. Okay. So. 
as much as we'd like to think that freedom from enslavement also means freedom from white supremacy, police brutality, and systemic racism, the reality is that 155 years later, people of color are, are still, as we speak, continuing to fight for the very equality and freedom that was promised to them. On a local level, just this past week in the LSCD, LCSD police blotter, the police were called because a woman was shouting racial slurs to a group of people on Lower Main Street Johnson. On a national level, it's important to remember that George Floyd's murder specifically is the very reason why we're having this conversation today. So when I read the House resolution, which in the first sentence speaks to, quote, the current struggle for racial equality, it made complete sense to me that this is the way that we should go because this proclamation doesn't just talk about the black struggle as a thing of the past, but as a thing of the here and now. It's not just a feel good statement and a happy holiday, but a call to action for white folks that our work isn't done and it has just begun. Um, in the Hartford statement, um, as rich as it is in talking about the history of enslavement and how it is celebrated, it does not name or call out current systemic racism until about paragraph five. And even so, it's just one sentence. As a town, we've adopted an inclusivity statement that states we reject racism, bigotry, discrimination, hatred, and violence in all its forms. And we have adopted an anti-racism commitment statement that states we believe that Black Lives Matter and, ref and remain fully committed to being proactive as leaders in standing up to and publicly rejecting any racism and bigotry. And we are committed to working with the Lamoille County uh, Sheriff's Department and our legislatures to deconstruct all policies and laws that create and amplify racism and poverty. So to me, this specific proclamation and all that it directly speaks to is an extension of the work we've already done and committed to continuing to do. So that's why I'm more in favor of the state, um, the House of Representatives one versus the Hartford one. Okay, anyone, board members wanna to speak to one or the other proclamation proposals? It's a hard subject, well, one is afraid of misspeaking. I, I'm in favor of the Hartford one and because I think that this is a Juneteenth proclamation, in looking at uh, what Representative uh, Kevin Christie submitted, uh, he, he indicated in, in a, uh, a question from uh, a reporter that with regard to the question of the resolution, there were two versions. The initial version was primarily about the murders and on the president's reaction to them. The version that you saw, which is what the one that we're talking about was voted in by the House of Representatives, was derived by adding Juneteenth to the continued to the combined resolution. Um, I think that uh, I actually think that the um, House resolution is the House resolution, and it's our representatives standing and voting almost unanimously. With that, I think it's uh, it, it it allows us as citizens to escape responsibility because it lays the burden on the police uh, and for you know which is actually a product of the committees that we that they're reviewed by. It's a product of of uh, people who are deprived of education that they should have and act in Minneapolis. Uh, access to housing and opportunity. And uh, the, the, uh, I think that focusing on the police is, is focusing on a symptom of the underlying problem. And I don't think it's actually strong enough. And so I would actually just go with the, uh, the Hartford resolution. Thank you, Doug. Anyone else? Does the board want to hear from the public? If any of the, any of the public, or is they prepared to hear from the public? Yes, please. Sure. Okay, Ma Brian. Uh, I don't see any hands electronically raised. 
Uh, so I've got to switch over to the other camera view. Um, is there anybody who would like to speak on this? Okay, Shane, I see you. Okay, go ahead, Shane. Yeah, um, I'll just say I, the house resolution was one that I was aware of. Um, I think that it wasn't drafted originally as a Juneteenth resolution, as Doug referenced. It was originally drafted as something else entirely, and the references to Juneteenth, Ju Juneteenth were spliced in there later on. Uh, it's also, I think, very telling about the the intention of that document that it doesn't mention the word Juneteenth until the 11th paragraph. So, you know, it is what it is. The legislature did vote in favor of it overwhelmingly. You know, I, I, I can't say I would have done differently. Um, there were several people in the legislature who found reason to vote against it. And I think, you know, they had pretty legitimate reasons to do so. And I think this board would have a legitimate reason to do so as well. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thanks. And we've got uh, Cal. Okay, Cal, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think they're both good, but I also want to just, uh, I think context is important. And I just want to, uh, for all of us to be aware that I think it's, it's really important that we speak to uh, uh, HR 21, I think, speaks very much to um, what brought us here. And I'd like to believe that when we look, when, when our children look back in history, that we've documented this. Um, and, and what brought the, what brought us to this? And I think that I think that HR 21 document does a much better job of that. Um, um, and also, and uh, also, if um, I think there's, you know, not that the the first uh, the first statement is is good, um, but I think there's a danger of us uh, of again whitewashing. And uh, I would hate for this holiday to just turn in uh, to echo what Kyle said as someone else taking, uh, you know, turning it into just a holiday. Uh, it should be a pretty somber occasion, obviously. Um, and I think the context of what brought us here is ultimately what's really important as we look back. So I would like to see, I would like to see that one, uh, if not voted on, maybe included as an addendum, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you. We got anyone else, Brian? Yes, I see Jackie has her hand up. Okay, Jackie, go ahead. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, um, you know, we had this uh, similar conversation the last time around just about the context, uh, about the point we are in history, about the fact uh, that, you know, we're only talking about this because of uh, the current uh, history that we're all living through. And, um, you know, the, the, so the House uh, statement and um, no matter what the process was um, to get it to where it got, to be a Juneteenth proclamation, um, again, was overwhelmingly supported. Um, Doug, you had said that you didn't feel that it was strong enough. And, uh, and I think you made a really good point there. But having said that, um, just because it's not strong enough to then go back to the weakest version doesn't make sense to me. Uh, Cal, I like your idea about, um, is there a way to, to pass uh, the one that Shane got from Hartford, did you, Hartford, is that the town that you got that from? So is there a way to accept the Hartford one and tag on the house uh, statement for the context so that we're not sort of left out there with this sort of very um, watered down happy holidays thing? Is there a way to have both of them? Um, is, that, is that possible? I, I don't see why not. Thank you. Doug, did you want to respond? Well, I guess I think the subject is Juneteenth, and um, it was very clear that uh, Representative Christie just added onto something that he had already composed with regard to these hor absolutely horrific acts. And the reason I don't think it's strong enough is because it 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 doesn't lay the blame where it should be, which is on 
we the people. Uh, and, and, you know, the police act the way they do because it's legal for them and they've been trained and we're where we allow that, you know. Uh, I, I think that they're scapegoats for us. Um, so I, I, I think that, uh, you know, I don't know how you, how you, I'm not opposed to attaching it that, and saying, you know, that here, you know, we adopt this and, and we recognize that the state has, has, uh, has adopted or the, the house has resolved as follows. Do we have anyone else? Yes, uh, Walter has, has his hand up. Okay, go ahead, Walter. Yes, thank you. Um, when the voters pass the inclusivity statement, the statement that they ultimately chose and amended and passed was stressing trying to change a statement and make it a positive statement. Whereas the House statement that got passed, H.R. 21, really just starts right out just damning everybody. It is not positive. I think the voters have said, we want to be positive. We feel this is an important issue, but we want to take a different tack. We want to take a positive tack. And I think the Hartford statement does as such. And when we talk about forming a committee and having people to having discussions and wanting to have a conversation, did anybody ask people how they felt when you take down half the U.S. flags on Main Street? No, nobody talked to them. We are just going to do it, and this we don't care. A lot of people in this town voted for a certain president. This HR 21 comes right out and condemns that person. So when you talk about we want to be positive, we want to have dialogue, we, we want to be inclusive and talk to everybody, but yet we keep, we're proposing taking actions, both the trustees, hopefully they fix things tomorrow night, and now the select board you're passing and you're, you're basically spitting, I want to almost say, on certain people and when their beliefs. Some people take the American flag very important. Some people believe in the president and you are basically condemning them. And they said at town meeting, we want a positive attitude. We want to take a positive direction on this. We do not want to be yelling at everybody. And so when you're looking at these two statements, I hope you choose the Hartford statement because that is the positive statement and you do not pass this HR 21, which is the negative statement and honor the wishes of the voters of Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Anyone else? Yeah, Jackie has her hand up. Okay, go ahead, Jackie. Thank you. Um, I guess that what I'm wondering is po th this notion of being positive. Positive for who? Who are we trying to be positive for? This is a Juneteenth proclamation. Are we trying to be positive for people of color celebrating the freedom of slavery? Or are we trying to be positive for people who perhaps this, this Juneteenth proclamation is irking? And we want to sort of pacify that because something bad might happen, blah, blah, blah. So who are we trying to be positive for? Where, what is the root and the impetus of this positivity? And I'm all for positivity, but not, um, not a false positivity, not a, not a, this, this, who are we trying to be positive for? The people of color or the people who may oppose this holiday, this town, taking a stand, uh, which we already took, against racism and bigotry and discrimination and violence. So th that's my point. Thank you, Jay. Welcome. Do we have anyone else? Yep, uh, Greg Tatro has his hand up. Okay, go ahead, Greg. Yes, uh, thanks. I'm with Walter on this. Uh, 
second statement is divisive. And, you know, we have an inclusivity statement in this town, which um, I really wasn't for it in the beginning. But once I read it a few times, I said, you know, this is a good thing. And when you're calling out the president and the people who voted for him in that town, that's not inclusive. You're putting, you know, it's easy to say the words, folks. But when you have to walk the walk, it's a different deal. And, you know, words are basically words. Actions are what count. And that, to me, that second statement, when you talk about the inclusivity statement, that eliminates that completely. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Greg, and... I just wanted to say that's exactly what it's calling out, what you just said. You just said it call it actions. It's calling out racist actions that we as a town have said once, twice, three times, four times that we reject racism, bigotry, discrimination, and hatred in all its forms. That is what we're calling what that's what the second that that's what the House of Reps calls out and rejects um racist actions and this is not yes this is not for us and our white comfort this is for people of color and i think we keep taking our eye off what this is all about <laughs> um and when we and we use things like say it's divisive divisive for whom it's divisive maybe for for uh, not for for people of color, this is aff this is affirming their lives, affirming their history, um, and I just I I don't know how to say it in another way. <laughs> um, I yeah, it's um, and it's yeah, it's just it's so important that we that you know, Bor Yang has told us in training. She has told us over a Zoom meeting that this. This is, um, this is not about our white comfort. This is about um, affirming black lives, their history, past, you know, uh, present and future. So I just, I, yeah, I, I've, I've, I've just got to speak up about that. Hey, I agree, Black Lives Matter, Kyle. I'm all for it. Uh, but we also, need to be a community and when you're calling out the president there's people in town that voted for him that aren't racist they just wanted a businessman in there and you know obviously it was probably a mistake because he's a, an idiot but there's still people that voted for him and when you're calling him out you're not including these people in 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 the inclusivity statement i understand that you and a lot of your folks hate the president. It, I, yeah, this I is not it. about well, hating the president. Well, this is well, about well, calling well, out well, racist well, actions. I, I'm all for it. I don't want to have any racism in town. But I also think if you're going to have good dialogue, like with this meeting, you need to have everybody in there. You can't just have, like, you know, the folks that are left the center in there because you guys have already got it figured out. You need everybody. And when you put a statement like that out there, you're not gonna get people to participate. And I just don't think it's inclusive. I'm all for, you know, I have friends that are colored in the community. And actually, I talked to Ada Parker the other day and I said, Ada, how do you feel in this town? And she said, Greg, I love living here. I wanna spend the rest of my life here. Similar to what Afi said the other night. She doesn't feel threatened and you know, I understand it's a national problem, but I do not think Johnson is a racist town. And I just, you know, people need to be educated. We need to get together and talk about things and work through things. But, you know, you can't alienate part of the population and expect everybody to participate. That's all I'm saying. Okay, do we have anyone that has something new or different to say, or is the board prepared to act on or not act on? Mr. Mr. Yes. Chairman. Yes, sir. I move that we uh, go with the updated version that uh, Shane Spence put forward. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and second. Do we have any further discussion? 
I, I would like to know about the idea of, um, I believe that Jackie brought up about adding this as an addendum. Mr. Chairman, could I change that with no addendum? Well, you don't need to change it to no addendum. It would require a motion to amend to add okay. an addendum. All right. Got it. I could withdraw it and uh, start again. No, your your motion's all okay the way it was made. Okay. It would be up to Carl if she wants to make a motion to amend. So, okay, so I make an motion to Okay, how do I say this, Eric? Make a motion to amend. <laughs> yeah, a motion to amend adding uh, the, the addendum as an addendum, the state proclamation or something along that. Line. The House of Representatives proclam proclamation. Yes. Okay, that please. <laughs> okay, we have a motion for an amendment to the original amendment. Is there a second? Lacking a second, the motion will die. We have no second, the motion dies. We now are back at the original motion on the proclamation as presented by Shane. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those in nay. Motion passes. We have a proclamation. Juneteenth. Thank you. Congratulations, Shane, for your, or thank you for your proclamation. Uh, new flagpole. Yes. So uh, there has been a suggestion of uh, possibly adding an, ad an additional flagpole on uh, either town property or uh, shared property uh, in order to hang a Black Lives Matter flag. Um, the suggestion has been made for one attached to the municipal building or uh, in addition to the flagpoles that we have. Uh, the, the flagpoles that we have are on village property so we would, it, that would not really be appropriate for the town but um, yeah, attached to the building or located on Legion Field. Um, so is that something the board wants to consider? What's the board's pleasure? The trustees are going to be discussing that tomorrow night. A community member is offered to put a flagpole right in the middle of the village. So I, I think that would probably suffice. I move that we erect a flagpole on the municipal property, building property. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Well, um, Kyle, could I ask, um, could that be a little more specific? Um, adding a flagpole and a, a Black Lives Matter flag, or is that your intent? Yes, my intent is to is to put a Black Lives Matter flag on municipal property. I I I, I couldn't tell you exactly where because I don't know where where um, some so, somewhere. <laughs> a couple suggestions that I had were were Legion Field and on the clock tower on. Uh, the municipal building. Um, yeah, I, I think that the yeah, and and I think the best thing that we could do would be if, if the village was willing uh, to put up a fourth flagpole in our collection of three flagpoles, but that that's not town property; that's village property. But we would need to work with them in order to hang something on the municipal building anyway. So, uh, yeah, I think if we're, if we're looking at shared property, the next step is going to be a discussion with the village and, um, 
I think we can discuss with the village where it would look best on municipal property. Uh, whether that's that might be something that's solely owned by the village. So this is getting pretty muddy. It is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess, Carl, I would look for a more uh, specific motion. Uh, where, well, what you're thinking? Just make a suggestion that. Yeah. We we um. Look forward to be on the on the clock tower. Um, as it's it's clearly joint owned. And there's no weird confusion around whether it's owned by one, you know, the village strictly. Um, it's it's quite visible up there. Um, it would be on municipal property, jointly owned. Um, of course, would re require the approval of the trustees. Um, I understand they're probably going to be. Um, going back on their idea of putting flags on um, on uh, electric poles. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, throwing that out there to see if that's. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, ideally, I, I think it would be best if the flag was as close to the other flags as possible. I think it's important as a symbol that it it's in it's in you know in in the same vicinity as um our other flags um so not to look well segregated from the others um but i don't know if that's possible like where is that village town line i guess or or, or the joint the village versus the joint line as I understand it, it's right on the edge of that uh, uh, assembly of flags structure. Okay, so could we could we put a flagpole right right there then, right at the the edge, right? That would it would be on jointly owned property. Right, that's what we're right. talking about. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's my motion to erect a flag right at that line <laughs> or, or right over um, where the, where the village owned flags currently exist. Erecting a, a Black Lives Matter flag. Correct. Correct. I'm sorry to ask. I just want to make sure we're being. Oh, thank specific. you. Thank you. I'm getting a little tired, so losing <laughs> it. Okay, so we have a motion to erect a flagpole with a Black Lives Matter flag adjacent to the current flag cluster. Correct. So do we have a second? I second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have discussion? So um, I just have a brief, something brief I'll say. Um, just a, a quote from Phil Scott. Um, he made a statement on Montpelier, the town of Montpelier painting Black Lives Matter on um, State Street in front of the Capitol building. And Governor Phil Scott said, I think this will be a necessary reminder that we need to make equity a priority and use this movement to drive real action that will benefit all Vermonters. Um, and I, I chose that obviously because uh, you know, Phil Scott's a, a, a pretty moderate guy and I, um, Well, that's it. Any other comments? Does anyone else get to uh, put a, uh, I'm sorry, Mike, you go ahead. No, you go right ahead. You, you started before I did. Uh, I forgot to raise my hand. Um, is there uh, anyone else have, has a right to put a flag on this poll or is this limited to Black Lives Matter? The motion was indicating a Black Lives Matter flag on the poll. I mean, should a future board, should a, should the board next month or or in down the road decide to put in another flag up, that's certainly the prerogative of the board, the joint board. Right, and I think we should, we cross that if that comes up, but I think right now this is what we're, what we're doing. Mike? That poll is still near the other, uh, the, the new proposed poll is still going to be 
uh, next to the fire department and all the other flags. Uh, getting back to Nat with your statement about Phil Scott, uh, there's two different things here. Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matter organization with the flag. Uh, there is talk, I, I read recently, about turning the Black Lives Matter movement into a political party. So if that be the case, are we going to fly a political party flag uh, outside the municipal office? Uh, so maybe somebody wants to fly a Republican flag or a Democrat flag or something. I don't think the town should be involved in any kind of political statement because this is a political organization. That is actually factually incorrect, um, Mike. Um, and because, um, sorry, I'm just, I don't want to botch this, so I'm just pulling it up. Um, so the Office of Special Counsel, which is an independent federal watchdog, um, has um, has informed uh, agencies, federal agencies, that supporting Black Lives Matters is not a political activity because the Black Lives Matter global network is not a partisan political group. Um, which means that, at least on the federal level, employees can wear or display BLM paraphernalia in the workplace and even invite others to a BLM fundraiser without violating the Hatch Act, which bars federal employees from participating in certain partisan political activity. So BL, this organization is actually protected um, under the Hatch Act. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Mike. I went online today and I, uh, I came across a Newsweek article. And it said a leader of Black Lives Matter's New York chapter said this past June, the movement was prepared to burn down this system. If the U.S. does not work with participants to enact real change, if this country doesn't give us what we want, then we'll burn this system and replace it, said Hawk Newsom, chairman of Black Lives Matter of Greater New York. So I could never support any organization that has rhetoric like that. Any further comments? Brian, do we have anyone in the audience, that, in the public? I'm not seeing anybody yet. Okay, Jackie. Okay, go ahead, Jackie. I'm sorry, Mike, who was that quote that, who? Ock Newsom, Chairman of Black Lives Matter of can Greater you, New York. Can you, can you spell that first name? H-A-W-K-N-E-W-S-O-M-E. Now, this was from Newsweek News. Yeah, yeah I just want to look that we'll up. Do a follow-up with it, you know. Yeah. I, you. When I, I kind of paraphrase it because I didn't, it was June some date he mentioned, so I said this past June. But that's the only thing that I changed on it because I couldn't well, remember um, the date. Well, Black Lives Matter, is, it's, it's a really loosely knit, huge global network, and there are authorized and unauthorized chapters of Black Lives Matter. And that's why I'm asking you who that quote is from. Okay, um, it but it's hot news. Like, yeah. Okay. It just doesn't sound like what I've read um, from the Black Lives Matter, um, you know, like official movement, okay. That, uh, okay. that type of speech. So what I'm um, suspecting is that is like a kind of offshoot and that um, it might not be as, as valid as, as you think it is as far as representing. Um, the Black Lives Matter uh, organization. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, all right, I've got uh, Phil Wilson up next. Okay, go ahead, Phil. Uh, uh, okay, thanks, Brian. Um, so yeah, obviously the trustees took um, this uh, issue up 
at our meeting last week, um, and we're meeting again tomorrow to discuss this. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, the board, the trustee board has received uh, a proposal to, to put a uh, flagpole up on private property on Main Street, um, which we're going to discuss tomorrow. Uh, so, I, you know, I think this, uh, obviously the ask was for the, um, the government to, to, uh, to do this, not uh, necessarily uh, uh, private actors. So, um, you know, th I think this is a, a, a relatively simple gesture that would be in line with the original request. Um, and it's something that hopefully uh, the trustees could uh, follow suit tomorrow, um, you know, potentially uh, when they meet. So I view, I view this is a, somewhat of a compromise between uh, the votes that, yeah, that the trustees have already taken and, and what we're gonna look at tomorrow. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Anyone else, Brian? Yep, I've got uh, Evan Patch. Okay, Evan, go ahead. I guess uh, supporting the movement, why doesn't the select board and the village trustees kind of just come up with one, we'll do it here. The village is meeting tomorrow on the same item. I don't, do we have any quotes out for these flag poles? Are we just going to throw them up? Are we going to put them on a two by fours and screw them and set them on the ground? What are we doing here? We got a drill and rig coming in. I, I, I support the movement. I guess it just to willy nilly go ah, throw a flag up, do it uh, over there on the lawn, and then the village is going to do the same thing tomorrow night. It could look better. If the two boards work together. Good comment, Evan. I don't have your answer. All right. Then uh, in chat, I've got a couple comments. Um, Rob says that he, he believes that this should be a town wide vote. Uh, Walter wants us to check on the flag code. And uh, Jasmine shares that uh, she agrees with Evan that the two boards should be working together on this. And that's the extent of the uh, public comment that I've got right now. I think, I think that's, that's the hope is that it's we we don't have a lot of joint meetings with the with the village trustees, um, and it it always is awkward when we do anything in conjunction with each other. Um, so one board will come up with a proposal and proposes it to the other board. The other board accepts it, rejects it, changes it, sends it back to the other board. That's um, that's just kind of the process that we're uh, that we have. And it's awkward. So would a suggestion be in order to table this until after the trustees meet tomorrow night where they're going to be talking about this? Well, I, you know, if we make a decision tonight, then that helps inform what they can do tomorrow, what they'll, they do tomorrow night. Yeah, I stand by continuing our path here. I mean, if, if this gets voted down, there's no sense for them to discuss this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Anyone, anyone got anything else? If I not, said, I, said ahead, I said previously in a, that I'm in favor of the flag on a municipal property and uh, that was when the it was not possible to put it on the village um, or on the flag code we couldn't pass on that I don't know what the flag code is um, the it it appears that the reason to have it proximate is to make it as strong a statement as as possible and 
not to be simply, you know, I think that painting on a sidewalk, Black Lives Matter, is not as symbolic to our way of reading things as a, as a flag, you know? So people are after as strong a statement as possible. I think we ought to coordinate with them. Um, I, have the, I have the flag code here. Um, okay. When flags of other pendants are um, flown from adjacent flag staffs, the flag of the United States should be hoisted first and lowered last. No such flag or pennant may be placed above the flag of the United States mm -hmm. or the United States flag right. So um, the, the flag code um, does not, this does not disrespect in any way the flag code or the American flag, which I respect very much. Thank you. Mike? This board should not be deciding for the whole town because there's going to be a lot of other people in town that aren't going to appreciate the town of Johnson endorsing uh, a political movement. Mike, again, it's not a political I know, movement. I know what you say, Kyle, but there is a, a move afront to make them a political movement, a political party. Uh, so if that happens, no. then, then what happens to, to the flag? Uh, I, I don't believe that to be the truth. Okay. Are we ready to bring it to a vote? Yes. Looks like it. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Nay. Nay. Uh, so we have to do a roll call if it's not unanimous. Okay. Again, all those opposed. Uh, uh, four signify by saying aye. That's not a roll call. No, that's not a roll call. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> it's getting late there. It's after. It is. What is it really eleven o'clock? It's eight after eleven. Doug, how do you vote? Nay. Nay. Nat, how do you vote? Yes. Yes. Kyle, how do you vote? Yes. Yes. Mike, how do you vote? Nay. And the chair votes nay. Motion fails. Town village merger. All right, next two items should go relatively quickly uh, because there's no news. Um, town and village merger is still out with the consultant with our requested revisions. Uh, the consultant is doing uh, quite a bit of work right now revolving around uh, other municipalities and COVID-19. Uh, so we are not very high on his priority list right now. And I just, I asked Brian to put these two things on the agenda, simply keep them on our radar. They were items that were voted on at town meeting. And unfortunately, the first one here, like Brian just spoke to, we haven't got the results from the consultant and the school merger question. It would be impossible to have a town meeting right now. So. That's why they're there. Yeah. Yeah, we, we could not have a, a town-wide meeting uh, in a meaningful way to do the discussion about the school merger the way the question was raised and asked at uh, the regular town meeting. So it is recommended at this time that we don't try. Um, I think that we would not be able to pull it off. So that is. Uh, Did anybody want to address any those? Questions about the village merger or the town meeting uh, for school merger? Greg, I think you had your hand up for something else. Uh, not this. You're all set? Okay. <laughs> okay. If there's no comments on either one of those, then I would move to the resignation letter of Charles Gallanter from the Fiber Committee. What's the board's pleasure? I move to accept Charles's resignation and thank him for the great effort that he put into it. And because uh, it's very important uh, to the formation of the community 
the communication union district and the uh, the unanimous support of the committee that he organized on that. That's a long-winded motion, but thank you. <laughs> we have a second. Is he listening? <laughs> no, I think he's already gone to bed. <laughs> Wise man. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Any discussion? All those in favor of signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Thank you, Charles. Uh, and that just brings up the question on the fiber committee in general. Do we want to disband it now that we have the CUD uh, organization or funding or process in place? Do you see value in keeping the fiber committee? Can we table that discussion? We can come back to it. I just, it's getting late. If we can just okay. in this meeting. Is the rest of the board in agreement? Sure. Okay, we'll come back to it. Make sure Brian will put that on a future agenda. Nope. Uh, I wrote down dad letter. And I don't know yeah. why. Yeah, okay. Um, I got I to get to it again. This is from Julia Mingeldorf. And uh, okay. she said, uh, hi, Mike, uh, would you please extend our family's gratitude and appreciation for how the community came together to take care of our dad. Their efforts were instrumental in saving his life. Big thanks from all of us, and especially from her mother. She says, my mother, Julia. And uh, also, I, I wanna thank uh, Kyle and Michael for what they did. And uh, they went, uh, and then all the other community members, <coughs> excuse me. And they went over and above, uh, you know, looking after Dale. Uh, there was uh, a number of people that got around him because he collapsed right in front of uh, uh, Kyle's uh, store. And uh, Michael went the extra mile and drove to Morseville uh, to make sure they knew who he was because I don't believe he had any identification on him. He was out for his walk, his daily walk. And... Uh, and I, we really appreciate what you, what Kyle and Michael did. And thank you again, Kyle, uh, for everything you did for our family. Of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like thank I said, Mike, you would do, uh, you would do the same for our family. Oh yeah, hundred percent. No question about it. And I'm so relieved to hear that he's alive, talking, eating, recovering. <laughs> well, you know, uh, you know, not to belabor this, but uh, when we took him to the hospital. Uh, I think I said to you, uh, the doctor in Morseville was crying and he wanted to give Rhoda a hug, but he didn't feel as if he could under this COVID business. So number one, when a doctor's crying, it doesn't usually bode well. And when they got him to Burlington, uh, the doctor saw him there and then they had to call the family all in for the end of life discussion. And at two in the morning, he came to, uh, started talking and, <laughs> everything else. I mean, he was a regular Lazarus. Uh, he had no brain waves, no nothing. They had given him up for dead. Uh, now there's a possibility he had his uh, pacemaker installed today and he'll probably come home tomorrow. That's so good. It's incredible. Absolutely amazing. So with all the help of the community, it definitely saved his life and there's no question about it. Mm -hmm. Send our, uh, the thoughts of the board to uh, his daughter and his family. Thank you. And thank you, Kyle. LCPC board ban, what was I writing there? That was uh, the um, LCPC has a survey and I, I asked uh, when out beyond my authority, I asked Brian Story if he would circulate something on Front Porch Forum or however else we could could to get people to reply to the online internet survey that's available at lamoille.tilsontech.com because that is about to, to, it's a survey of who would be willing to and sign up and commitment to, uh, to broadband in our community. Now, of course, the, the nonsensical part of this is the people don't have online internet access. So we have, that, that primarily would want this. So, but we should do our best to get to the people. And um, 
I, I guess I'd like to see if there's any other ideas on how we could facilitate this survey and get adequate responses. Because broadband is important to our community, as we well know now. Anyone have any thoughts? Or are we still thinking? Sleeping. <laughs> Sleeping. Charlie's awake. It is for it. And we had our fiber committee conducted a similar survey and they use Tuesday Night Live in order to reach everybody, which is not an option this year. Um, yeah, this year is going to be extraordinarily difficult to reach anybody who doesn't already have broadband. Hmm. Yeah, I'm happy to um, put it on the Johnson Work site. Again, that's an online <laughs> forum, so. Um, might not be getting to the people that we need, but that's something I can do for sure. Are we able to mail um, like a little half page announcement with absentee ballots? I doubt we can include it with absentee ballots because that's anything election related is pretty tightly controlled. Yeah. Uh, I can ask Rosemary about that, but I, I doubt it. Um, but no, it's a long shot. But I suggests that we pay for mailings uh, for Johnson uh, and suggests that there, there could be a, a real equity problem if we don't use the post office. That, that anything other than mail in the current times is uh, kind of fraught with uh, challenge. Is there any chance the village would have a mailing that we could insert this with? We can ask. It wouldn't go to the people you're trying to reach, though. Well, there are um, there's some people who are unhappy with Comcast that might be interested in. Yeah, but they connecting. can see it on the internet. You know, they probably have internet connection. The ones you're trying to reach are the outlying areas of the town, right? I'd like to reach out to them. Yeah, I see Charlie is is awake. What if? Uh, a bulk mailing postcard or something, isn't that fairly inexpensive? We can look into that and see what the cost is, but I don't recall what the, the cost was the last time we, we did one. We did one for, I think, VT Alert not that long ago. Yeah. And, and the cost was manageable. Maybe see if Sue Lovering is willing to put it in her column. That's a good idea. Yep. I mean, okay. Could, uh, does anybody have any other thoughts, or do you want to call it a night? Let's call it a night. I'll follow up with Brian on 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 these three okay. suggestions. Okay. Eric. Yes, sir. I, I want to. I think I got ahead of myself. He came to it two in the morning, and he started talking a little later in the day. Okay. But anyway, it was a miracle. Yeah. Well, unless anybody's got anything else, I would say we're adjourned at 1120. <laughs>